Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Chatting with Nuts. This is episode number 56. I haven't done a back-to-back -back, like week after week in a while, uh, but the way scheduling worked out, this is how we uh, we ended up doing it. And tonight, I am joined by a first-time ever guest, and that is Bridger from the Library Ladder. How are you? I am doing very well, thank you. Um, and I have to say, you know, when, when you invited me on the show, I... I, I reached out to some people I trust, you know, who's, who have experience with you. Um, they reassured me that you're kind, you're gentle, uh, dare I say even tender. Um, so I'm very happy that you are my first. Um, and I'm just so glad to be here this evening. Well, I'm glad to have you. And uh, I appreciate all that. appreciate all that. It mean, means the world to me that people trust trust me to, uh, you know, be so gracious and kind. Because if you asked Alan, Alan would say I'm not any of those yeah. things and possibly even Philip Chase because I'm always uh, making fun of him on this show. But <laughs> I'm excited that you're here. Uh, you were one of my most requested guests ever. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with the quality of videos that you've been putting out um, over the last, how long you've been doing this? Less than a year, right? A little over a year. I mean, my Always first substantive video was probably around maybe December of 2022, 20, I'm sorry, 2021. So almost a year and a half, about a year and a half. Yeah. And you've, uh, uh, you've gained quite the following in, in just yeah. a little over a year. I, I, I'm amazed. Um, I mean, I, I wish I could put out videos a lot faster. I'm slow, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I have fun making them and I want to make them the best that I can. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a, a trade-off that, you know, I, I could, I could churn things out, but then I wouldn't be very happy with them. And yes. ultimately I, I just want to, you know, do what I enjoy. And, you know, I hope other people like watching them and, you know, maybe find them, you know, engaging, informative, uh, at least that's my hope. I think that people definitely do. Uh, Alan is hoping that you'll look down on me that you have more subs than me because I do that to him constantly. So he's, <laughs> he's excited that I'm the small fish, uh, here tonight. Uh, oh, I can't believe that it, it grew that fast. I've only put out about, I don't know, 37 actual mm -hmm. substantive videos. Um, so I mean, when I started the channel, I mean, I was talking to my wife and, you know, she was like, you know, you sure you want to do this? And I was like, well, I think it could be fun. You know, I, I have some, some qualms. Yes. But, uh, you know, I was telling her, you know, I, I think it, it, it could conceivably, you know, reach maybe 10 or 15,000 subscribers at the high end. <laughs> I'm like, you know, a year later I'm at 13, four. <laughs> wow. This is great. <laughs> I'm, you know, far surpassing what, uh, my own expectations were when I started. Uh, I mean, cause yeah. I had no expectations. I think that that happens to a lot of people. I know with me, I, it was, it was when I hit 5,000 subscribers, I was like, Oh, people are listening. Like nor like regularly people are listening. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I still to this, to this moment, uh, even now, like looking and being like, Oh, 80 people are watching me and knowing that thousands after the work, after the fact will watch. It's like, that's crazy. Uh, it's a little nerve wracking. I have had similar thoughts, you know, when I look at like the cumulative views and, you know, it's up there in the, you know, hundreds of thousands, I'm thinking, am I actually having an impact on people? Um, I mean, is this actually doing some good or maybe is it doing some harm? Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I have my, my own reservations about social media in general in terms of, you know, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? And, uh, you know, I'm trying to do good here. So that's my hope that, you know, if I'm able to uh, make a difference in some way, that's great. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that you have some of the most educational content out there. Um, you know, I, I said, say this all the time about uh, Philip and a critical dragon as well. Like, you know, I learn things when I watch their, uh, their videos and I always learn when I get to watch your videos and you put out a video this week, which we kind of talked about last week, whenever we were in a private chat and it's all about the Ballantine publishing company. And I just thought that video was awesome, man. And I, I love, this is something you've done in all your videos. I just love that your B roll is like your own B roll. You know what I mean? You're not using stock footage really. Um, everything's shot and you, you have a lot of the additions, which was really cool, especially for the Ballantine stuff, because I'll be honest, I didn't know that any of that existed until you told me. <laughs> so like that was a huge, uh, chunk of knowledge for me to digest. So I, I love that video, man. 
Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. it. It actually was not the video that we were talking about last week. Uh, this Valentine one was a, a, a last minute replacement. Uh, I mean, it was a rush job. Uh, I was working on a different sort of a bigger uh, one, right? Bigger one looking at, you know, the roots of the fantasy genre. And uh, I mean, I've been working on it for weeks and it, it was spiraling out of control and I needed to get a video done. And, and so this Valentine one was planned to be a companion to that other one. So I was going to follow up the bigger video with this Valentine one, uh, but I hadn't actually prepared the Valentine one, but I thought, okay, I need to pivot because you know, the scope of this other video, my thesis is getting very unwieldy. I'm, you know, it, this thing is just, it, it's too big at the moment. So I needed to figure out how do I pare it back down and reframe it. And it was going to be far too much work. And I, I really wanted to get something out, especially knowing that I was going to be coming on your show. I thought, you know, it'd be nice to have something to talk about uh, that's current. And so I said, well, let me, let me just see if I can quickly throw together this Valentine one. It's not my best work, um, but I'm really happy that I was able to pull it off in as short a period of time as I did. Uh, I did get a comment on the video today that sort of took me to task. Uh, uh, and I completely agreed with the commenter. I mean, he was being very helpful in his criticisms. Like, you know, this, your thesis really isn't structured right because your title actually doesn't match exactly what you're saying in your video. And you really should have structured it differently. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. I should have, if I had actually taken more time to think about it, like, you know, normally I try to put a lot of thought into, you know, what I want to say, how I want to say it, yeah, how to tell a story because in, in most of my videos, that's really what I'm trying to do is tell a story of some kind. And I, I rushed it on this Valentine one, but I'm so happy that the response from viewers has been really, really positive, except for that one. Uh, but he was absolutely right. And I completely agreed with his comment. Uh, so uh, I'll do better next time. I, I mean, good constructive feedback, I think is usually welcomed. I, I've, I've actually had better, like uh, more constructive feedback than I've actually had like really bad comments. Like, I feel like I've been very fortunate in that because I've seen some people who get just landmines i mean just craziness in the comment section i've been very fortunate even in this live chat you know i i don't we don't have a ton of troublemakers and we always have thoughtful people um i even had a comment today on i did my kind of in a nutshell wrap up for for may and person asked and they said hey why don't you wrap up your the manga that you read because I, I read a decent amount of manga and i said i don't know i used to I just kind of stopped doing it. And they were like, I don't even read manga. I just thought maybe your other viewers might want to know that you read manga. I was like, this is interesting. Like you were thinking of my general view. You know what I mean? Like they don't even care about it. Um, but yeah, I made a little note. I said, remember to cover uh, graphic novels and manga next time. And uh, yeah, sometimes those comments, like you said, take you to task. And you're like, you know what? You're right. You're right. <laughs> I think I've been very fortunate. Uh, you know, the vast majority of people who've commented uh, on my videos or in other forums, you know, have been really positive. Uh, yeah, I've gotten a few constructive criticisms, and I welcome them. Uh, I've had a few people flat out disagree with you know whatever I stated in my videos, which is perfectly fine. I I think uh, disagreement is healthy. We all have our own perspective, our own way of reading, the things that we enjoy or don't enjoy about reading. Uh, we might interpret things differently. Uh, disagreement is very welcome uh, on my channel. I just ask that it you know, be polite and uh, respectful. And uh, you know, there have been very, very few instances of you know, trollish behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, uh, you know, when somebody does that, I give them a chance and I, I, I try to respond uh, usually with friendly humor. Um, and if that doesn't work and they still continue, then I've had to block a couple of people, um, but only a couple over the last you know year and a half. So I'm, I'm really happy that it's a nice audience. Um, you know, this, this is, yeah. this is a, uh, just a, a great crowd to be around. And I, I, uh, feel bad that I have not been nearly as active in this kind of bookish community uh, as I otherwise would like to. Uh, I only discovered BookTube 
uh, about two years ago, um, uh, maybe a little over two years. It was during the pandemic. I didn't even know BookTube existed. Uh, I, I rarely even used YouTube, in fact. I mean, YouTube for me was how I learned how to do things. Uh, you know, if I need to, you know, fix the drain pump in the dishwasher in the kitchen, I find a YouTube video about how to do that. Or if I, I mean, I, I uh, finished my basement uh, a, a few years ago, uh, single-handedly, I might ask. It was quite the undertaking. Uh, but I, I, ta I taught myself how to do it by watching YouTube videos. And <laughs> it, that's what I used YouTube for. I didn't use it for entertainment. Uh, the pandemic hits and then suddenly yeah, I have a little more you know, time and you know, I discover, hey, there's this whole community of books and I like books. And, uh, <laughs> and I had other things going on that I was very uh, involved with from a, a bookish standpoint that made me want to talk more about books. And suddenly I said, hey, here is a forum to do that. And, you know, the rest sort of is history. Yeah. Um, who was the first book tuber you ever watched? Like, what was the first book video? Okay, this is probably going to be a cliche, but it's going to make perfect sense because it's really the algorithm that's driving all of this. Uh, Daniel Green. Um, yeah. Same and, here. <laughs> and I, I think the one that I watched was it's his history of the fantasy genre that he did, you know, maybe three years ago. I think that might have been mm -hmm. the first one that I saw. And I was impressed. I, I thought, you know, that's a nice discussion. Um, and, you know, so this, this video that I've been working on for myself is along those same lines, only it's not a, it's not a repeat. You know, what I try to do with my videos is figure out what's already been done on YouTube and then not do that. Um, you know, I, I'm looking for things where I can add value, where I can add yeah. to the conversation, where I can highlight books or authors or, you know, history that nobody's really talking about uh, just so that, you know, I doing something useful. Uh, yeah. Because that's really what I want my videos to be is is useful. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense because you came to YouTube and got a lot of value out of it, right? Like learning mm -hmm. how to finish your basement saved you tens of thousands of dollars uh, to do that. So to want to add value into some, some kind of community and something that's really important to you makes all the sense in, yeah. in the world to me. And, and I, like, I like that. I like the fact that you saw room uh, to, to do something different and you did it. Because I think a lot of people... Um, we'll take things and then they'll try to tweak it just ever so slightly and say, it's mine. And I always, I always say like, there's like archetypes in, in booktube. Uh, and when people get outside of those things, those are the videos I'm really excited about watching, uh, a lot of the time. And then there are some people who can just talk and I'm just glued, I'm just glued to the screen. So, you know, everyone has their own, their strengths and, and their weaknesses. Right. And this is my strength, to be honest, is, is long form conversation. And, uh, you know, uh, trying to curate some sort of discussion about anything, really. So uh, I think you've you've definitely added value uh, without a doubt. And I, I, I would say that based on your Valentine video, I think that was like 30 minutes or so. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was about a half hour. Like so I'm gonna... 28. Yeah, about that. So what are we thinking for this this history of the fantasy, John, the roots? Like, are we thinking over an hour? <laughs> It was already spiraling past an hour, and I don't want to go past an hour. Uh, I, I really do not want to go that long, uh, uh, partly because it's a lot of work to make those videos, yeah. especially the, the long ones. And yeah, I mean, I love making them. They're, they're some of my favorite ones to make, but I, I am, am trying to find a, a happy medium between you know being completely thorough and not wasting too much of my time or the audience's time uh, because not everybody wants a deep dive into things they really would like more of a me more of a medium dive and and that's more what i'm aiming at uh mm -hmm. to to get people interested um i mean one sort of an analogy that i i i use to describe many of the videos that i make uh, particularly when I'm talking about specific books, I make movie trailers for books. Um, you know, it, it's not exactly what I'm doing, but my goal is 
to give enough information about a book um, to get people interested in reading them. Uh, because a lot of the books that I focus on are books that aren't part of the common conversation on BookTube. Uh, yeah. And many of the books are maybe used to be well known. It's just, you know, new generations have found new authors, new books, more current stuff. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't want a lot of the older stuff to get lost in the shuffle. So, you know, I try to position them in a way that makes people go, hey, I didn't know about that book or that author. And that sounds really interesting. I want to read it. Uh, but I do try to do honest trailers uh, to not just hype a book to make people want it. And then they'll be disappointed in the end because, well, it wasn't as good as advertised like a lot of actual movie trailers. Um, and I don't do the spoilers, so I don't give away all the punchlines. Say so that's and, the difference between you and a Hollywood trailer is that a Hollywood trailer right. that shows you all the coolest parts of the movie. Like I don't watch them anymore because of it. I hate movie trailers and you know that do that. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I try to avoid them too. But but in a sense, that's what I'm doing. Uh, just trying to to put teasers out there to say these are worth paying attention to. These are books that are going to appeal to some segment of the audience out there. They may not appeal to, to everybody because we all have our own unique tastes. But yeah. But these are books that should not be forgotten. And, and that's what actually prompted me to start the channel in the first place. Um, and I don't, you know, most viewers probably don't realize, I think I've alluded to it maybe once in a video at some point in the past. My plan for this channel was to focus on children's books to begin with. Yeah, you told uh, me that, blew my mind. Uh, this, this was not... I mean, what I'm doing now is not exactly what I had in mind. Uh, I wasn't foreclosing this in my mind. It's just the, the impetus was some experience I've had over the last several years uh, volunteering in, a, in, in my kid's school when they were younger uh, to lead a, a book club there. And it's for middle grade students. So it was a fifth graders and sixth graders and they would read 15, maybe 16 books a year and you know, discuss them. And it, it was a lot of fun. And I got very frustrated with what I was seeing in both the, a lot of the modern books that the kids were reading, but also frustrated with the fact that many of the kids just weren't reading um, mm. or they, there was a, a real deprioritization of, of reading in the culture for a lot of kids these days. There are just too many other uh, sources of stimuli. I mean, you've got everything from YouTube, uh, TikTok, yeah. video games. Uh, I mean, you name it. Reading often is kind of low on the priority list. And I would get frustrated that a lot of books that I grew up reading that I think are just classics and wonderful uh, were not in the conversation at all. They, they were not even aware of it. Uh, and the, the teachers and, and librarians that kind of organized the club tended to prioritize books that were published just in the last few years. It was really focused on new stuff. And, and while there, there are some wonderful new children's books that are being published, there's also a lot of dreck. Uh, I'm sure. You know, a, lot of a lot of stuff that you know, to use a Calvin and Hobbes reference is, is like chocolate frosted sugar bombs uh, for kids. I mean, because, and, and the authors and the publishers know this because particularly for young boys, I mean, reading is not a priority. Uh, the, the, the rates of reading between girls and boys at that age is alarmingly uh, disparate. I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's very concerning. So publishers are trying to, attract all of those boy readers back. And to do that, mm. they're making these completely ridiculous stories. Like um, what? Can you give me an example? Oh, 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 oh. I wish I could. Uh, I mean, there were some books like, uh, there's there's a book called The Doldrums. Uh, this is not the worst offender in my opinion, but it's a, it's, it's bad. Even though it's gotten great reviews, if you look, online. I mean, the reviews are like, oh, we love this book. And it is such a, a knockoff of like, if you took 
uh, Roald Dahl and um, let's see, I'm trying to think of what were some of the other influences that I, I read. But but then you you cranked it up, not to 11, but cranked it up to 21 in terms of the absurdity and the logical inconsistencies and the just all around um, nonsensicality of it. It was just a, intended to be a pure adrenaline rush. And mm. I thought, but this book is completely illogical. And not that all stories have to be logical. Obviously, we're, you're a fantasy channel, and I do right, a lot yeah. of fantasy. <laughs> Obviously, fantasy is not, Wait, it's know, not real. inherently logical, but there does have to be at least some internal logic, especially if you're writing a story that's yeah. supposedly set in the real world. Uh, I, I, they, they just get out of control. I, so I, I, and then I had another experience with, uh, you know, they would read one classic novel per year, except classic was generally defined as written more than 20 years ago. And, you know, I like, you know, for me, that's, you know, classic probably extends a little farther back. Uh, and uh, there was a, a suggestion to read Anne of Green Gables, which is a wonderful book. Uh, I absolutely love Anne of Green Gables except the librarians who proposed it said, yeah, but we can't read the actual Anne of Green Gables. It, it's too long, it's too hard, which it's not. Um, <laughs> so let's read the graphic novel adaptation of Anne of Green Gables. Mm. And that just really frustrated me because the graphic novel is faithful to the book and it's, you know, it hits the plot points. The artwork is mostly actually quite appealing uh, despite having little orphan Annie eyes for the characters, but you know, no pupils, no, it's just circles or ovals. <laughs> uh, and, but otherwise, you know, the artwork is, is lovely, but the emotional depth, the, the, the descriptions, the, the whole character development is missing in that graphic novel adaptation. Uh, but the librarians were worried that, you know, readers won't really get into reading the actual book, uh, the original, because yeah. it's too long and it's just not that long. And, you know, they've, they've, they've lowered the expectations for, for kids these days that, you know, kids just aren't able to read, at least in their minds, kids aren't able to read a lot of these books that were very much read by kids that age, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40, you know, a hundred years ago. Yeah. So I, I thought I want to make a channel about children's books because I have a lot of them. Uh, I, you know, before I started a family, I uh, was at my local library and I just saw, you know, I was actually looking for some books that I wanted to reread, you know, books that I read when I was 10 or 15. And it's like, yeah, I, wanna, I wonder if this library actually has these books. So I went and I looked for them and they didn't have any of them. Uh, and I, I discovered that, you know, libraries regularly call their collections. You know, if a book hasn't been checked out, you know, in the last so many years, you know, they figure, well, let's make room for new books. So we'll get rid of these older ones. And so I discovered a lot of these older books that I loved as a kid weren't even available for kids anymore. So um, I, I started collecting a lot of those older children's books uh, because I thought, yeah, I want my kids to be able to read these. Mm -hmm. uh, I, want, I want them to have the opportunity. And of course, this was long before, uh, you know, Kindle and e-readers and, you know, the, the ability to, to digitize books that way. So I'm, I'm really actually quite happy that Many of these titles, not all, but many of them are available in at least uh, ebook form uh, if they're not you know, available in, in hardcover. Um, but, you know, so I, I started the channel. I, I made my first couple of videos were actually kid book videos. They got no traction. Uh, the, the children's book corner of BookTube seems to be very small. Uh, and then I you know, made a, I made also made a couple of other little overview videos, just talking about parts of my book collection. And, uh, the, the two videos, actually the three videos that 
absolutely the algorithm loved uh, were my fantasy, my science fiction video, uh, and my illustrated book video. And so- Really? Yeah, uh, I love book illustration. So I, I have a lot of illustrated books. Um, and, and so my initial subscribers were from three different areas and um, <laughs> You know, I, I realized, okay, the algorithm is trying to tell me something. I, I need to deprioritize the children's books. Uh, I haven't abandoned them. I'm still making children's books videos. Uh, but I, I figured, well, let me broaden my discussion of, of other types of books. And uh, you know, I did a, a Thomas Covenant series video, which was really my first substantive book review video. And, mm -hmm. and that one seemed to get some attention. And I realized, okay, well... This works. Let me continue with this. And uh, a couple of videos later, I uh, I did a a Brandon Sanderson video. Uh, but I figure I still want to do kid videos, so I'm going to do Brandon Sanderson's children series, his Alcatraz series, which I, I I love. And I know Sanderson gets knocked for his sense of humor in a lot of his other books, but in this particular series, it's all about the sense of humor and it's completely off the wall. It's just, it, it is, it is a lot of fun. And he clearly was writing it both for kids and for adults because there are so many inside jokes uh, that he just, you know, <laughs> Easter eggs that he sprinkles throughout the books. Um, and, and, you know, I read the books with my kids when they were younger and, and they absolutely adored them. So I thought, well, maybe I can kill two birds with one stone. I can talk about fantasy icon Sanderson and children's books with Alcatraz didn't work. You know, the video flopped. <laughs> I don't know. You know, fantasy fans didn't really want to read about or listen uh, to uh, children's books, uh, even if it was written by Sanderson. Uh, so then I made a, a Guy Gabriel K video, and that one actually sort of launched me. Uh, That's and, the one um, I saw of you. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I adore uh, K. Uh, I mean, his works, uh, I, some of the absolute best reading experiences I've had have been with many of his books. Uh, he, they're just, I just find them extremely satisfying. Yeah. It, it's almost, and I said this in my review for song for, for our bone, but it's like, he's almost too good. Like he doesn't really, like, I almost wish he would, uh, like have a, a flub every now and then and mess <laughs> up or maybe take a big risk with something. Uh, not that his books aren't exciting, yeah. Um, but it's just like one of those things where you get to the end of the book and you're like, I don't know what to pick apart here other than like that one weird like sex scene that might have been a little odd. Like that's the only thing I can say. And he's just he seems like he has a handle on everything. Yeah. Like I th those scenes really are there's something <laughs> they're, they're, they're these non sequiturs almost. It's like, why did you put that in there? But the thing is, is they're, they're isolated. It's like, OK, there's this scene. You can skip it. It doesn't actually change the story at all. Uh, and it's not like he's gratuitous in, you know, putting it throughout the book. It's like, okay, there's yeah. just this one scene and it's usually not very long. And it's like, okay. Apparently he feels like he's able to relay things about the cultures that he's trying to study um, in those scenes. Like he's very interested in like the history of, of that. Uh, so that that's what I've heard. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he succeeds because I'm not a scholar in uh, sexual history or anything, but uh, it certainly always makes my eyebrows raise. So, I mean, it, they're yeah. remarkable. How about that? They're very remarkable. Yeah. Right. So for those of you who are maybe a little squeamish or, you know, just uncomfortable, you know, with, with some of those types of scenes, trust me, you can read Kay's works. And if you get to that scene, you can just skip right over it. It's not going to change the you know, ultimate enjoyment of the book or your understanding of the plot. Um, and when you mentioned, you know, that you, know, you want him to screw up, I actually think there is a book that is a, a misfire and that's Isabel. And okay. it's a good book. I, I, I'm not trashing the book. I, I enjoyed it, but it was his conscious attempt to write a YA book hmm. uh, because he had teenage sons, I believe. I don't think he had any daughters. I think he had teenage sons at the time. And he wanted to write a book that they could read, that they would enjoy. And so his protagonists are 
teenagers. And I just think that he didn't quite capture yeah. exactly what being a teenager is like, because it's set in the modern era. I mean, it's, it's a modern day, and I just, I think he didn't get it. He didn't quite um, it's like the Buscemi, get the character uh, right. Yeah, the hello, fellow kids. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, George R. R. Martin says that's why he feels uh, like Bran is the hardest character that he has to write as a POV because he's like, I don't remember what it's like being a six, seven year old boy. Yeah. Like, I just don't remember. And also, like, happens to be a boy who has you know tons of trials and tribulations. He's like, yeah. my childhood wasn't that tragic. So how do I write this character? So I, I there's a lot of people who struggle to write children. I, I agree. Um, I mean, it's what makes good children's books really amazing is when you have mm -hmm. adults who are able to write good child characters. And then you have non-children books like Stephen King, mm -hmm. uh, although I did start reading King when I was a child, but it, <laughs> it, it's not children's lit. Uh, King writes amazing kid characters. I, I'm, I'm in awe of how well he's able to capture, um, yeah. you know, a lot of the thought processes, processes and, you know, just, you know, the insecurities and the, uh, the everything about being a kid. It, it, it's really remarkable uh, when you can do it well. Yeah. When there's something that takes me back to feeling like a kid, uh, it is one of the most magical reading like experiences that I can have. And King is the one that always does it for me. Yeah. And actually, and I don't know if you read manga, I'm going to assume you don't, but uh, Urasawa, this is 20th century boys is actually heavily inspired by Stephen King. Oh. And uh, there's flashback scenes. It's basically his version of it, to be honest with you, or at least somewhat mm -hmm. inspired by it. <laughs> and there are childhood scenes in here that are one kind of cringy because you you know, kids are kids are kids. So they just do yeah. cringy things, but Oh my gosh, I was reading this and it gave me King vibes, which took me back to childhood, you know, pinning up posters in the, in your clubhouse and that kind of thing. Like, I don't know. There's something special about that. Well, I, I will admit I'm not a manga reader. Um, I'm shocked. You know, I, I am, I'm, I am not philosophically opposed to manga. I'm not, I mean, this is not a, any sort of a judgment other than it's not how I like to read. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for Backward. me, reading is, <laughs> is this immersive experience where I love, you know, where an author can describe things in words and I'm able to take those words and create a picture in my mind. And manga sort of short circuits that process. You don't have as many words and you have to rely on the artwork to tell a lot of the story. And it's not my preferred way to experience those kinds of stories. It, it, yeah. It's just, it's just how I read and, and how I process it. Yeah. It is interesting that like you would think that there's like a, and there is a correlation obviously, but like that's one thing whenever I started reading manga that I was missing things cause I wasn't paying attention. I was just reading the dialogue. I'm just reading, you know, yeah. I'm burning through this thing. And if you were like, well, what did you think about that panel whenever that I'm like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't see it at all. I was just reading the words, you know? <laughs> um, so they are very, very different uh speaking of the kid characters and and noel actually left the comment about this i've heard this before that robert mccammon is great at writing kids i, I just saw that comment myself and i was going to say i have in my queue of planned videos a robert mccammon retrospective um so i'm giving a little advance at i hope that i can get to it my, my goal is to do it for the halloween season um because nice. i love mccammon and and boy's life is my all-time favorite sort of kid centric horror story of it. I mean, it's better than it. It's better than summer of night by Dan Simmons. I mean, I, I think boy's life is, is, is outstanding. Um, and other McCammon as well. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a fan uh, very much of, of McCammon and he doesn't seem to get a whole lot of attention. I mean, swan song gets attention. Boy's life gets attention, but he's got a sizable, you know, kind of back catalog of, of works, uh, many of which are very readable. Not, not all of them. Some of them are a little weaker than others, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I want to highlight McCammon uh, coming up later this year. The uh, one series he has, the Matthew Corbert series, mm -hmm. is that right? Corbett. 
Corbett. All right. I always, always mess it up. Uh, my friend, Scott, the bald book tuber, he loves that series. And then other people that I know have picked that up are like, they're like, why is no one reading this? Like, this is so good. And there's tons of books. And I think it's set in what the 1800s. It's like 1800s mysteries kind of thing. It, it is a, uh, a fascinating series. Uh, and it, it's also interesting. Some of McCammon's uh, own backstory, because he was a very prolific writer back in the 1980s and early 90s. Um, and then he, for personal reasons, stopped writing um, and for quite a number of years and only came back to it um, in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years. And uh, the Matthew Corbett series is kind of the culmination of that, that all of that downtime, recharging his battery and getting... Mm. new ideas and, you know, fixing some of the stuff that he wanted to deal with in his own life uh, before coming back to writing. And I think it really, you know, paid off that, that time that, that he took to do that. Um, I, I highly recommend um, McCammon and, and that series. Yeah. I think I'm going to be doing boys life of his next. I, so I've only read Swan Song um, yeah. and I think I'm the only person in the world that thinks uh, I still like to stand a little bit more, to be honest with you. Um, it stands infinitely more flawed, but I just love it. Yes and no. Uh, I, I'm actually in complete agreement with you. Let's the stand go. is better. The stand oh, is yeah. better. I, I, given the two, I pick the stand. However, there's a big caveat here. <laughs> there are two versions of the stand. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. the original, you know, that he wrote back in 1978 or so. And then there's the unabridged version that he published back in 1990. <laughs> and there is a big difference between those two versions. And the original version is better. So um, you, you like the shorter one? Oh, much better. I mean, the, the original version, it's still long. I mean, it's a huge book. At the time I read it, I read it when I was I don't know, 13. Uh, and it was the longest book I'd ever written or ever read. Um, although I guess technically maybe the Lord of the Rings was longer if you could count it as a single book, but yeah. they're both enormous books. And yeah. I, 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 I loved it and I've read it multiple times since then, but he, when, when he issued the unabridged version, he required, um, his publisher to stop publishing the original because he didn't like all of the editorial changes that his publisher made with the original. He wanted to add it all back in. And so he said, no, from this point forward, the public only gets to read the long version. Hmm. And there's too much filler. There's too much extraneous stuff in the long one. It, it, it just doesn't flow as well, in my opinion. Um, and I really wish that he would at least now allow both versions to be hmm. sold. Because now, I mean, if you want to read the original version, you have to buy it on the used book market. You have to buy one of the old paperbacks. And I bet you have you can it. Find it. I have the original hardcover and paperback. I do. Uh, I have awesome. my original paper. I read it in paperback and I still have my original copy that I had as a 13 year old. Uh, <laughs> but it is a it is a better one. So if I were to compare Swan Song to the unabridged version of The Stand, I would probably pick Swan Song, even though I do think Swan Song has flaws of its own. Yeah. But the original shorter, you know, by, I don't know, four or 500 pages. Shorter. It's significant. Yeah. I mean, it's still an 800 page book. So it goes from 800 pages to 1200 <laughs> pages or something like that. Uh, I, I, so those of you out there, if you have doubts about reading the stand or if you it tried to read the unabridged one and just it didn't resonate with you, track down hmm. the original. It might yeah. make a difference for you. Yeah, I've never actually um, heard of much comparison, to be honest with you, because like I, I only had the unabridged as right. like my option. And, and to be honest, I loved it. Like, again, I knew there were flaws in it and there's big, long stretches of that book where I'm like, what are we doing? But like, it's just pure cocaine driven Stevie. And for me, I'm like, ah, there's something about that raw creativity that I kind of enjoy. Uh, <laughs> but I don't blame anyone when they're like, this is too long. It's stretched out or they hate the ending. I'm like, I get it. I understand all of these things, but in spite of those things, I still just, it, here's the thing. I also read it right at the beginning of COVID and that uh, was a bad idea 
it's not a good idea at all, actually. And it was also uh, a time in my life where I was just going through stuff. And I, I think everybody was at that point. But um, I had a lot. I, somehow I escaped from one you know, terrible situation to another. And I don't know. That book has a, has a special place in my mind. Uh, it's also one of the books that uh, I did review for on the channel. Terrible video. I'm sitting in, I have like a man bun because, you know, all the hair places were closed. And I mean, just a terrible video. And uh, I got a lot of traction for my channel at the time because the TV show was coming out, the, the terrible adaptation that they did. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I guess I have a lot of like subjective things about the stand that I just, I really like. And Swan Song was great. I didn't like, this just sounds weird. I didn't like how optimistic it was. <laughs> like it was very optimistic to me at the end. And I was like, I don't know if I like that. Like he built such a terrible situation very, very well. And I just didn't buy the comeuppance at the end. You know, it just didn't. Uh, maybe it didn't ring true for me is, is how I would say that, though. I think that sounds a little bit harsh, um, but I have a lot of hope for boys life. I think boys life. I, I, I like that type of story. So I think that that one's going to be good for me. And I think it's, uh, is it shorter than Swan Song? I think it is. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It's definitely shorter. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I see a couple of comments. So Michael asked, how many original editions of King do I have? A lot. Uh, I, I don't have every book. I don't have every one of King's. I've, But I have most of them. Um, and I do have first editions of all of the early ones. Um, uh, I mean, I love the early ones. I mean, those are the ones that I grew up reading. So, uh, you know, my first King book was Salem's Lot and that hmm. scared the bejeebers out of me. Uh, you it know, is creepy. 12, as a 12 year old. And uh, I, I, I loved it. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> then I went to the stand, read the stand. I, I, I really love his short story collection, Night Shift, uh, his first collection. Yes. Um, great collection. Some some of those some of those stories are <laughs> so ridiculous, wild, uh, and yet they're so compulsively readable. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'm I, I generally prefer early early King. Uh, some of his yeah I I actually read everything he did up until Tommy Knockers, and Tommy Knockers was a disaster. I DNF'd it. I I just. And I mean, he's acknowledged that he was absolutely high on coke the whole time that he was writing that. I mean, I, 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 I that book dragged so badly, and it was just it was not well written, you know, at least by the standards that he had done before. And I was starting to get into a lot of other types of reading, other books and, and genres. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, I've had enough King. I don't think I read another King book for another ten years wow. after that. Uh, and then I came back to King, you know, later and started picking up some of the things that he had done in the interim. Um, and, you know, more recently, and I have to say, some of those things in the interim were very much a mixed bag. I mean, I think he was really struggling to find a consistent voice. Of, of, I mean, I, I, and I don't, don't know exactly what was driving his writing decisions at the time. Uh, but it wasn't until probably under the dome that I found something close to early King. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the feel of it had, it just had a feel very much like, you know, the things that he was writing in his first decade uh, of writing, at least up until the ending, the ending was disastrous, but you know, so I don't <laughs> want to spoil it, but yeah. I, I'm reading it this year in October. Uh, I, I mean, it's, 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 I highly recommend Under the Dome. It's a great read, but I really wish he had done something different with the ending. Um, <laughs> for the amount of investment of time that went into that book, both for him to write it and for me to read it, uh, I, I wanted more. Hmm. Yeah, I know he gets a lot of grief for his endings, but I do think he has some good endings as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the ending of Pet Cemetery is phenomenal. Uh, that's one that, like, people acknowledge it, but, like, when they're, you know, just dumpstering him for his endings, I always bring that up as, like, my anecdotal, like, counterpoint, because he can do it. It's just he doesn't yeah. always do it, <laughs> unfortunately. I I know. I, I Pet Cemetery is another one that, at the time I read it, was probably the scariest book I'd ever read. Uh, or at least the, you know, yeah. the scariest that I'd ever felt reading a book. Yeah. Um, 
and I mean, it eventually was surpassed by Summer of Night by Dan Simmons. Uh, I mean, there are parts, particularly in the first half of Summer of Night, that just was giving me the shivers when I read it. Uh, hmm. I mean, as an adult reading, not as a kid. I mean, I was still a teenager when I read Pet Cemetery, but you know, as a full-fledged adult reading horror, I don't normally get scared. Yeah. Um, and I got scared reading Summer of Night. Uh, there were just some really well-done scenes, uh, in, particularly in the first half of it. Uh, oh, yeah, Josh, uh, 1122.63 has a beautiful ending. I liked 1122.63. That is definitely one of... You know King's better ones. It's my um, favorite King book, I think. It's either that or Pet Cemetery, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I believe his son helped him with the ending of eleven twenty two sixty three. So maybe he should have brought him into the creative process earlier. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I, I I get requests from viewers. I've gotten quite a few saying, "Well, are you going to do a Stephen King, you know, retrospective?" And my answer is really probably not. Uh, really, I mean I. I love King. I mean, I, I have read a lot of King. I haven't read everything, but I, I have read quite a bit. Uh, but others have already done it. Uh, I mean, Josh has done his own mm -hmm. retrospective of, uh, of King and did a great job of it. And so, as I said earlier, I want to do something that hasn't already been done. I mean, I, mean, I want to add you know, a new voice to the conversation. And I'm going to guess that probably a lot of what I would have to say is going to echo what other people have said. Yeah, um, I feel so, that. And, and so I get a lot of those kinds of requests. Well, are you going to do Wheel of Time? Are you going to do, you know, Malazan? Are you going to do like, you know, Robin Hobb, Realm of the Elderlings? Like, well, I really enjoy those. I, I you know, I'm happy to say I recommend them. But for the time being, I'm not, really inclined to do a retrospective of them because uh, I, I want to do something done. Oops. Yeah. Hang on. Okay. I'm You're back. back. Yeah. That's it was good. only for a second. You were fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. You want, you I, want for those of you watching, I'm in a Faraday cage right now. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm in, I'm in my library, but the problem is, is this library has bookshelves that are three feet deep on all four walls. So it blocks all signals. Uh, so Wi-Fi and cell phone coverage and other things are really difficult to get uh, in this room simply because <laughs> the walls are really, really thick. <laughs> just, just pure binding, keeping it out. Just all this intellectual <laughs> right. property. Just, I mean, that's why you can read so much because you're not distracted while you're in your library. That's perfect. <laughs> yep. uh, that's incredible. I, uh, yeah, I definitely loved your a book collecting video. I even watched it again this week, uh, prepping for uh, this show. And so many good pieces of advice, too, because I can't tell me time. You, one of your things is, you know, collect books that you like have an affinity for or like you want or that you've read and you enjoy, like whether it's the look mm -hmm. or the feel or whatever it might be. And you did bring up something I thought was hilarious, which was at the beginning of COVID when people were just decorating their bookshelves for their zoom calls <laughs> and like, you would see like, you know, it would be like a 23 year old dude who definitely didn't have pants on, but had a tie on and he has Ulysses in the background. And you're like, you didn't read that dude. Like stop. <laughs> just set pieces. Right. Right. Um, or I'm not knocking like some of the specialty press editions, but you know, people who have, entire walls of nothing but folio editions. Um, I, I, I think they're beautiful. I, it, this is, but, but are they actually going to read those copies or are mm. they just for display? Yeah. Uh, because when you're paying that kind of money for books, are you really willing to, you know, put the wear and tear on them? Yeah. Uh, and you know, for me, books are to be enjoyed. Uh, I Part of the appeal for me, and I, I mean, I have a lot of older, you know, first editions and things. I read the older books uh, partly because there's almost like this, this psychological connection uh, yeah, that I can get to that book knowing this is actually the copy that was produced at the time the author wrote it. And particularly for books that are, you know, many, many years old, you know, a hundred years or older, I know that 
I'm not the first person to read it and that maybe multiple generations of people have read it and that this book has, this actual copy, physical copy of a book has had an impact on other people's lives. Um, so, you know, particularly for some of the, the things that are very old, there are copies that I think this might have actually changed history. You know, some of my nonfiction, I have a lot of uh, uh, nonfiction works, you know, that are historical in nature, uh, a lot of old geography books, you know, that are basically teaching people about the world at the time when the world was still a big mystery for most people. Um, you know, I, I have a, um, a, an atlas of the world that was written uh, by Sir Walter Raleigh. And it's actually a, a copy that's, you know, 350 years old. And this is the guy who actually was exploring the world, sailing around the world during the age of exploration, you know, putting down all of his, his adventures, what he discovered. And other people 300, 400 years ago were reading these actual pages and learning about the world. And I, I just find that hmm. fascinating. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a, this psychological connection. Um, that I could never get, say, reading a digitized, a scanned version on a Kindle. It, it's yeah. not the same. So I'm going to step off camera for just a second. I need to grab a Kleenex. Uh, so go for it. Right back. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah, it like, uh, feels like atlases kind of make uh, Google Maps lame in a way. Uh, you know, Google Maps is, is what we have now, and it's so easy. I mean, it is kind of cool to go look at your street at that given point in time. That is pretty cool. But yeah. uh, there is something about the lineage. It, it, lineage is important to you. Like history of books are very, is very important to you. I think preservation, I would assume, is something that you're very concerned with, the, just given the yeah. way that you talk about your collection. Um, so what got you into reading? Like, obviously, you started young, but uh, maybe what made you fall in love with reading? Was it a book? Was it a certain author? And uh, beyond that, I'd love to hear like your first fantasy experiences. I did start reading young. Uh, I was, uh, I guess, about three. And it, it's kind of a strange story because um, I have a, a sister who's a year older and my mom and my sister would, you know, sit in my parents' bed and, uh, you know, leaning up against the headboard and they'd have a, you know, a book in their lap. And, you know, my mom was reading to my sister and my sister was learning how to read. Uh, and so I, being the very curious type, you know, wanted to know, well, hey, what's my sister doing? You know, I want to be a part of this. So I would creep up the foot of the bed and and then I'd peer over the top of the book to follow along. And I actually learned how to read. I could do this repeatedly over weeks or I don't you know, I don't know how long it took. I don't really remember those days very well at all. Uh, but I actually learned how to read upside down before I learned how to read right side up uh, because I was reading from the top of the book and <laughs> I would, I mean, obviously I, at that time as I was reading, I was learning to read picture books. Um, and so I generally read picture books right side up, but I could read them upside down. And in fact, I would occasionally, I mean, I, if I picked up a book upside down, sometimes I'd just read it upside down because I could, it wasn't anything uh, that I was doing really consciously. It's just, that's happened to be the orientation it was in. I did get in trouble by around fifth grade. Uh, I think it was, I was in class and I was reading a book, but I had the book upside down and the teacher thought I was goofing off. I got in trouble and which was really surprising because I was a good kid. I was, I was never a troublemaker and the teacher was very concerned that something was <laughs> wrong uh, with what I was doing. And uh, you know, I, at that point I realized, okay, there's value in conformity. So maybe I should just read right side up. <laughs> Uh, and you're trying to start so a new I, trend. That's all. I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I d wasn't doing it consciously. It's just, I picked up the book that way. I read it that way. Uh, I mean, I can still read upside down. Um, uh, I, 
I, it's one of those things that's now been hardwired into my brain since I learned it at a very, very early age. Uh, my first really significant reading experiences as a kid, uh, there are a couple of them that really come to mind. Uh, for my fourth birthday, I got a, a, a very famous, iconic dinosaur book. Uh, it's the golden book of dinosaurs. And it's this big, large format mm. picture book. Gorgeous artwork. Um, the, the artwork is actually very famous because much of it uh, decorates. There's a mural of it um, at one of the history museums, I think at Harvard, um, but it might be at MIT. It's one of the universities, uh, I think, in Boston. And... Uh, I absolutely read that. I mean, I taught myself in some respects how to read by reading this dinosaur book. And within a, a few months, I, my dad gave me, you know, a couple of his old Hardy Boy books that he read as a kid. And then I found a couple of uh, older books at a, a garage sale a neighbor was having. And I just, I love them. I mean, this was, this was real reading. There were no pictures in the book, or at least very few pictures. And I loved the mystery and I loved, I mean, I loved everything about that. Um, so I, those are some of my earliest memories of reading. Uh, but I, I devoured everything as a kid. I, that is not the book. I was going to say, uh, this me, is the big golden book of dinosaurs. So maybe yeah, this was this, a sequel, maybe? Um, that, is, that, that is definitely not it. This was one that was uh, written, published back in the 1960s. Okay. Uh, has I was trying a, to find light, it. Yeah. It, it's, it's long out of print. Uh, do you but it's, it? it's absolutely good. Oh, I do. Uh, I yes. have two copies of it. <laughs> I have my great. original copy that I got when I was four that is wow. falling apart and wow. because it's falling apart i had to track down another copy just so the preservationist in me would have another copy of it amazing uh, and uh so if, if you can find that one it, it's it's you know got this big light blue cover with uh like a tyrannosaurus rex uh attacking a stegosaurus if i remember correctly uh, on the front cover oh i it, i think i have found it and i love it very much oh wow that is a massive picture let me see if i can find one that isn't so massive um here is one that someone actually put online i don't know why they're all so big but uh let me just share my screen again so you got everyone can see this i also just love dinosaurs to be honest with you so i'm i'm excited to look at this this is it right no, no? that is that's a little golden book uh that's uh -oh. um that's one of the small formats. Uh, okay. I do have that one. I mean, I, I had that one as a kid too, but wow, the golden. this one is probably twice the size of that. Um, well, apparently it's, it's, it's rare. A, it's a big it's, book. I cannot Hard find to it. find. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it has been out of print for probably close to 50 years. Um, wow. But it's great book. Absolutely great book. Hmm. Uh, well, let me see. I, I haven't even been looking at the comments. I have no idea what's happening here. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. What was Mozart your first? Uh... Reportedly read music upside down. I did not know that. Thank you. Yeah, for you're a child prodigy. <laughs> I don't know about that. I uh, <laughs> I just got exposed to things at an early age, I guess. Oh, and uh, Cy uh, Kepler said, "What was the second oh. book you mentioned?" Oh, I it was a, a Hardy Boy book. Uh, so I yeah. I absolutely devoured the Hardy Boys and, and Nancy Drew. And I mean, I I loved all of the mystery stories uh, when I was a kid. In fact, one of my very first videos I made was, you know, why aren't there good mystery stories for kids anymore? Uh, I mean, there are still some, but they aren't nearly as prevalent as they used to be. And so you I know, miss all them. Ambitious writers out there, you're looking for yeah. a niche, you found one. There you go.
do a good mystery. I it, mystery is actually essential, not just the kids' books, but to, to most of my favorite books, like have a central mystery to them, right? Like even a Game of Thrones, right? It is a murder mystery for that whole first mm -hmm. book, and I loved it. I also book that kind of copied that was The Expanse, of course, because it's written by George's two assistants, uh, Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank. Also, a mystery at the center of it all. Like that drive, I think that's like my favorite thing that a story can have. It's just like a central mystery <laughs> that has to be solved. Uh, and I remember reading Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew as well. And I love them so very much. Which versions did you read? Because they've been rewritten oh. multiple times over the uh, years. And... Whatever was in my school library. Because I, I didn't buy those. Um, I would just check those out. And I do remember... Uh, my librarian. So I was a, I was very late to reading. Most of the kids mm -hmm. were reading in like second grade. So I didn't learn how to read until like late third grade, early fourth grade. So they were real concerned about me. Like, oh, no, you know, he's a moron. And uh, so once I was able to read, it was like I unlocked a superpower. And then by fifth grade, I was reading at like what they considered to be a senior level. And then they put me in the gifted program, uh, which I got ejected from, you know, fairly quickly because they <laughs> well you, you you surpass them right i mean they, they i well, came in we quote, don't have anything we can teach Austin. this guy yeah that's the, <laughs> i wish that was the case they were like kids who come in quoting stone cold steve austin in like an undertaker shirt are not to be in these classes you know <laughs> i would i would be beating kids in chess and be like giving them the birds like I, you can't do that dude <laughs> you're out of here <laughs> but that's funny i I, I have to admit that I, I couldn't believe that you were actually a wrestler. <laughs> Me either. Um, I, I, I thought you were joking. I mean, I think, you, you know, when I first found your channel, you know, a while back, I I think this is maybe in your about statement or something, you say, you know, I'm a fake wrestler, fake pro wrestler or something. And I thought, yeah, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to interpret that because, you know, wrestling is often described as being fake. Mm -hmm. So were you actually a real pro wrestler engaged in fake wrestling or were you actually just pretending to be a fake pro wrestler? It was a little ambiguous there. So I, I did in fact stalk you a little bit online to try and figure out, was he actually a wrestler? Because I didn't bother scrolling all the way down to the very beginning of your channel where I think your first couple of videos mm -hmm. were in fact footage of you wrestling. I didn't realize that. And I, I imagine my surprise when I, I, I found you really were a wrestler <laughs> i did that shit. I thought, yeah <laughs> I, I i thought this is amazing and and he likes books too uh you know this is even more amazing i i'm stereotyping here terribly and i really shouldn't <laughs> No, for good reason uh, i didn't fit in i didn't fit in into, into a lot of the locker rooms you know i uh i had a full-time job outside of the business a lot of guys didn't um i mean it's weird that i did it it's weird it feels like a different lifetime uh for me in a lot of ways. And, and it is confusing, right? Because you hear pro wrestling. So people will say things like, oh, so you were like amateur wrestling. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like mm -hmm. I was a professional. I had a uh, pro wrestling license in the state of Kentucky because you couldn't wrestle in Louisville at OVW unless you had a, a license. They actually had a, a licensing program, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, was this but, like the minor leagues? I mean, you've got like WWE or whatever the yeah, organization so WWE is. And, is and, like and so the there's the, the major leagues and then there's the minor leagues. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of that's how it used to be a long time ago. Because I, I would watch pro wrestling as a kid, or actually, I remember in my freshman year in college, um, you know, my, my in my dorm room, I had a, a, a roommate who brought a TV with him, and every I think it was Sunday morning or maybe Sunday around noon, there'd be the pro wrestling and you know the junkyard dog and yeah. all of these other you know wrestlers from that era. But it was very regional. I mean, it was, yeah. the, these shows were not national. Mm -hmm. They were syndicated regionally. So most of these, you know, things were happening. And I mean, I grew up in the South. So uh, there was a strong wrestling culture down there in the South at the time. Uh, so my local hometown had a wrestling ring and would broadcast wrestling shows on Sunday afternoons. And, you know, my roommate would watch them and I'd watch them and I found it entertaining, but ultimately a little puzzling because I just yeah. couldn't understand why people would do that to their bodies. You know, these, you know, 250, 300 pound people being pummeled to the, to the, to the mat. Granted, I, I think there's probably shock absorbers in the mat to uh, 
minimize yeah, the injury. It's hard to fake gravity, is is what I yeah. always tell people. Um, but you know, watching Andre the Giant going, that man's enormous. I mean, I, who would even think of getting in the <laughs> ring with somebody that size? Uh, Andre that was, was, was a was a crazy guy too. Uh, he was yeah. a nice guy, but man, he was, uh, he was wild. They said he could drink like 48 beers in two hours and he would just be buzzed because he was just yeah. so big. I mean, he's just a crazy guy. Um, yeah. So I wrestled a lot in the South and there are still regional things that happen mm -hmm. and still get broadcast on TV. I wrestled at a place called SAW in uh, Kingsport. No, not Kingsport. It was, it was in Nashville, Tennessee at the stadium in, and I remember being like, and, and back in the day, SAW uh, was kind of adjacent to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, which was like the big thing in the South. And I'll never forget being like, wow, this is like 2010. I was like, wow, I'm going to be wrestling at this place that, you know, legends have been to. And I get there and it's the stadium in and we're doing TV. And the first thing I see is a, uh, a, a lady of the night. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, where am I? <laughs> and I uh, realized the stadium in was like an hour uh kind of in <laughs> you know what i'm saying and we were in the back in the ballroom i was like oh my goodness so the, the business is uh it's a weird thing what i but i also tell people is that it's weird all the way up so wb seems clean and professional but it's still as carny as anything else in the business mm -hmm. um and, and i got to experience it all i got to experience wrestling in mud pits uh you know outside of uh, bingo halls and i got to wrestle in front of tens of thousands of people as well so i really got the full experience the only thing i didn't get to do was go to japan in England, which were two of my biggest goals. I mean, I also would have loved to have been signed to a million dollar contract, but that didn't happen for me. So, um, yeah, well, it's, you, it's a wild thing. You, you have wonderful stories to tell your kids and anyone and else who. <laughs> and some not to tell. <laughs> yeah. That, I imagine. <laughs> uh, um, I see Michael a question here. You know, did you read any of the three investigator series? Good call. That's my, actually my all time favorite uh, children's mystery series. Uh, I adore the three investigator series and it just pains me that they are not in print anymore. Um, I, they deserve to be in print. They were so fun. I, I wanted a, I wanted a clubhouse, a secret clubhouse in a junkyard just like uh, Jupiter Jones had with all the, you know, the, the <laughs> trap doors and, and, and booby traps and other you know, things that it, it had. Uh, those were some really, really good stories. And, and the first 10 or so were actually written by a very well-respected um, mystery author for adults uh, named Robert Arthur. Uh, so, hmm. you know, he primarily wrote... Uh, short fiction. I mean, he did write some novels, but he was more of a short fiction author uh, in the the mag in, in the mystery pulp magazines uh, from like the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And he was asked by his publisher, the, you know, they wanted to, excuse me, do this series of books for kids. They said, you know, will you write these? And it's, you know, the Alfred Hitchcock presents the three inves investigators or Alfred Hitchcock and the three investigators. Uh, so Alfred Hitchcock is a is a character who plays a tangential role in the stories. Uh, he sort of frames the story and then the, the kids actually do this mystery solving. And these Robert Arthur ones that he wrote are really well done. Um, hmm. And in fact, the first of them, The Secret of Terror Castle, is the book that prompted my lifelong love of classic movies. Uh, so I'm, I'm a film geek too. I'm a book geek and I'm a film geek. Uh, okay. I, you know, my, my favorite channel on TV is Turner classic movies. Uh, so, hmm. and secret of terror castle is all about old Hollywood, you know, back in the silent era. Uh, and I just thought it, thought it was fascinating because I didn't really know much about it at the time when I was reading it. So it's amazing what you can learn and what you can just hmm. get inspired by. Uh, yeah. from the, the various books you read as a kid. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, I, I have the Tom Swift books. Uh, I have a lot of those. I'm looking at the, the comments here. Yeah. So, One of these days, I'm going to do a bookshelf tour of my my cabinets full of children's, you know, the book series from the, you know, sort of the 
1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, they are they are a lot of fun reads. I'm not going to lie. Uh, you have some bookshelf tour videos, and I have put them on at night to go to bed because you have just the voice that like just soothes the crowd, you know. And and I'll be honest, I, I said this uh, on Chatting with Nuts a couple episodes back. I said I'm going to get Library Ladder on here. We're going to find out if that voice is real. We're going to in live real time. We're going to find out, and it is. It's, it's your actual voice. <laughs> I hope I haven't disappointed anybody. Um, yeah. th this this is in fact my voice. Uh, there are many comments I've gotten <laughs> on my videos where people accuse me of faking it. Uh, you know, they accuse me of well, you're using auto tune or something to <laughs> you know manipulate my voice, and you know that this this isn't really how I talk. I'm like actually, this is how I talk. I've talked this way. This has been my voice since I was 15, hmm. and when I was 15. I can assure you, I did not look like an adult at 15. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I was a scrawny kid with a voice like my dad's. Um, I actually sound a lot like my dad. And it would turn heads. You know, people would be, I'd speak up and people would go, huh? Who is that talking? <laughs> well, that's really weird. How was that coming um, out of that? That's weird. <laughs> it, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, some scrawny kid. Uh, you know, now I'm a you know somewhat scrawny adult, but at least I'm I'm a tall scrawny <laughs> adult. Uh, so the fact that I'm you know I'm about six four, so it 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 oh, doesn't okay. seem quite as inconsistent, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I need to be tall here in my library because the uh, the the ceiling is about fifteen feet high, uh, and my ladder is only twelve feet, so. <laughs> To reach the top shelves, because the shelves go all the way up uh, 15 feet, uh, I, I have to get really high on the ladder, and it's a little scary. And I'm the only one in my family who can go up the ladder um, to get to the top. Uh, you know, my kid's definitely too small, and my wife gets a little nervous. I get a little nervous going up to the top uh, because yeah, I did I actually like have a mishap at one point where the, the pads on the bottom of the ladder slipped. Um, uh, the the, the pad was the wrong kind of pad. And so the grip didn't work. And, and literally I'm at the top of the ladder, the bottom of the ladder whoosh, slides out. I'm amazed that it didn't destroy any of the glass you know, uh, pa panes in the, the cabinets. I mean, it, the damage was absolutely minimal and just amazing to me that that happened, but I'm left up at the top <laughs> dangling from the, the molding at the top of the bookshelves you know, 12 feet in the air. Um, and I can't fall down because I will break a leg if I fall down because the ladder is down below me and I mm. don't have an, an easy landing spot. So I'm dangling up there, yelling at the top of my lungs, you know, for you know my wife or my kids or somebody to come rescue me. Uh, I mean, it's a little scary going up. <laughs> Uh, reading is a dangerous game i try to tell people <laughs> all the time i risk my life every time i open up a book I'm like, you never know what could happen yeah i mean paper cuts those are a thing <laughs> um i got one about a week ago i, I agree <laughs> uh andre uh, says your narration of the telltale heart was fantastic and this is a question i had uh actually wrote this down one of the few things i wrote down for notes for this was uh have you considered trying to do audio books because i feel like you would do fantastic at them i uh, want to do more of those I, I did those last halloween a couple of you know kind of spooky stories for fun, you know, I, there had been a few people on the channel that had, you know, commented and said, "Hey, you know, you should consider doing audiobooks." And I, I thought, well, that would be fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did a couple of stories. I liked it. Uh, I, you know, I hoped people enjoyed them. I uh, mentioned in the video I just uploaded yesterday that I am planning to do a retrospective of Lord Dunsany, mm. uh, his works. You know, early fantasy pioneer uh, from you know, a hundred years ago. Great talking, yeah. I want to record uh, a decent collection of his works as audiobooks and make them available as kind of a companion to that retrospective video. So mm -hmm. that's my goal. Uh, whether I can find the time to actually execute yeah. is the challenge, uh, as it always is with all of these videos that I make, you know, finding the time to make them and 
you know, get them out in a timely manner. That's, that's, uh, that's my challenge, but, but that, that is something that I want to do more of. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope people enjoy them. Um, it, it is fun getting into characters. You know, I, I don't think I do great character voices. Um, you know, my accents are definitely a little challenged. I mean, there are certain accents I can do, I think pretty well, but there are others that, I'd probably struggle with, and I'm not real sure that I want to try them. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I th there's a certain performative aspect when you, you know, just start there at the microphone, looking at the text and just trying to think, how do I inhabit this character? Uh, because that's how I read. I mean, I read immersively. I like to try to put myself in the shoes of the characters I'm reading. And I think, narrating an audiobook is much the same way. I mean, it's a form of acting. For sure. Uh, but I, I've never really done much acting. I, I, I was part of a, a theater troupe, very amateurish theater troupe uh, in graduate school, but I'd never done acting before. And I don't think I did a particularly good job of it on stage. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but uh, I think it might actually be a little easier doing it just with a microphone uh, because mm. there's, there's no audience watching. There's no self-consciousness. You can just do whatever. And if it doesn't work, you just, you know, start over again and you record it a different way. I mean, you, yeah. you know, whatever take that you're doing, whatever reading of it, it's like, okay, I really didn't like how that turned out. Uh, let me try again. Whereas if you're doing a live performance, obviously you get one shot at it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's it's you know you're you're living in the moment at that point, so there is something yeah. kind of comforting. I mean, so I do a podcast uh, as well as YouTube, and I've always found that I feel more comfortable on podcasts. Um, there's there's no pressure of the visualization, and and you know I I don't know I don't actually like looking at myself to be honest. So I, I enjoy podcasts a little bit more, but there are times where I feel like I'm actually more expressive on podcasts because there isn't the visual element. So I feel like I need to really, you know, uh, give my mood up in my, in my tone, like kind of play it up almost a little bit. So I could definitely see that. Uh, I, I, I definitely am looking forward to any kind of audiobooks uh, that you want to put on your channel, especially those audiobooks that that have been kind of left out of a lot of right. um, audio performances, because whether there's yeah. rights issues, I'm thinking of Jenny Wart's uh, Wars of Light and Shadow. Uh, there's an audiobook, I think, for the last one, maybe, or there is going to be but, one, but you know, largely there aren't. It, it frustrates me the gaps in you know the audiobook uh, publishing libraries. I mean, the, the there are so many classics that have just never been recorded, and whether it's because the rights holders never thought of it, or they just don't think the economics work, they'd have to pay too much you know, for what they think the sales would be, you know, that, you know, pay a, a narrator to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, or if there's just disputes over the rights. Uh, I, I actually listen to a lot of audiobooks these days, uh, you know, for the last probably at least 10 years. Uh, I've, I've found that I can make more time for reading, yes. uh, you know, like drive time or, yeah. you know, just doing household chores when I'm doing the dishes. I'm listening to a, an audiobook while I do the dishes because doing the dishes requires no mental activity whatsoever. So I can actually focus on the the book that I'm listening to. And it, it's really nice. And and for certain types of books, I think audiobooks enhance the reading experience. Oh, uh, I, mean, I, I mentioned this in my Guy Gabriel K video. The, I mean, Simon Vance is a phenomenal narrator. And He's so good. his audiobooks... I mean, I've never listened to a Simon Vance book that I have not liked. I mean, I think his performances really elevate all of the material that I, I've, I've listened to of his. But the K books in particular really fit his narration style well. Um, and he adds additional emotional depth that the books already have plenty of. Yeah. But because you get that extra little bit from the, the the nuances of his vocal inflection and the tone and the pitch and all of those things. Um, it, it's really nice. So I, I, I read a lot of, of audio, listen to a lot of audio books. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a trade-off. I, I can read more books that way, 
I don't retain my memory of the books quite as well listening. Yeah. Um, I'm more of a visual learner than I am an, an, an auditory one. And so, you know, books that I listened to just a few years ago are now a little fuzzy in my brain. You know, they start to kind of blend together. And, uh, you know, I, I remember more about what I felt listening to the book. I remember a lot of the, the big picture takeaways from listening to the book, but a lot of the, the specific character details or plot details uh, get a little muddy. And, and I do regret that. Um, but I think for the most part, it's worth it because I'm getting more enjoyment, more opportunities to enjoy books um, by, by listening to them. But there are many of them like Jenny Wirtz. Jenny Wirtz is a big gap in my, my reading. I have never read Jenny Wirtz. Uh, I have several of her books but I have not yet read them um, and I want to. And I've really been hoping there'd be audiobooks that would come out that I could listen to because it's easier to do it that way. Yeah, so. I would love to experience her work on audio because I have struggled at times because um, it's very dense writing. I, I think it's like the densest writing I've ever actually experienced and in, in sp definitely for fantasy. Um, and her vocabulary is just so wide and i i would wonder how that experience would be on audio i wonder if it would aid me in any way because sometimes there are books that when they are read aloud i i tend to grasp them a little bit better um i did immersion reading so i was following along at, when i did malazan for like the back mm -hmm. half of that and i actually felt like i had a better experience hearing it out loud as i followed along so i would love to try that um with with janny's books and you know who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe they will go back and release some audio books. I think that would be, that would be terrific. I, yeah. we did have a question here and I wanted to bring it oh. up. It, it pivots back. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, absolutely. I mean, okay. I, I'm not paying too close attention to the comments and I apologize for all of you posting comments. Oh, no, you're I, good. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm always curating over here. I'm just, I'm, I'm multitasking. Uh, but Derry had a question. I, and I like this question a lot. She says on children's books, how do you feel about changes made as society does? I'm thinking specifically on recent alterations to Roald Dahl. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I have very mixed feelings. Uh, I, that's a very diplomatic answer. I know. Um, <laughs> But if you actually look, I posted a short right after that controversy mm -hmm. uh, because I have several of Dahl's first editions uh, as children's books. I mean, I, I, I think highly of them. Uh, and it bothers me that books are being revised. Uh, I mean, to use the Hardy Boys in, as an example, I mentioned they've been rewritten multiple times over the years. And while some of the changes I think were warranted, most of the changes have essentially dumbed down the books. The, the original versions written in the 20s and 30s and 40s are much more intelligent reads. I mean, the, mm. the plots are better. They're more sophisticated. The language is more sophisticated. I mean, they were actually writing those books for 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds at the time. Um, but there also were some insensitive elements. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there are certain um, racial or ethnic stereotypes that would crop up in a few of the books. It was very sporadic. It was, it was, it, the vast majority of the books didn't really contain, excuse me, objectionable material, but there were a few that had some problematic elements. And so starting around 1960, they, the publisher rewrote the books to do two things. One, pull out all of the objectionable stuff, which was a good thing. I mean, it, 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 it didn't need to be in there. It wasn't essential to the plot. Um, and they also started changing some of the plots, though, to update hmm. the technology. I mean, you had readers, you know, a lot of these books were written back when the technology wasn't as advanced it was in 1960. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so cars were called jalopies back in the 1920s and 30s. Well, by the 60s, they really weren't calling them jalopies. I didn't anymore. know that. Uh, <clears throat> and so they, 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 they changed some of the wording, but they also simplified a lot of vocabulary. 
uh, because what they discovered is the age range for readers was getting progressively younger, um, that younger readers were reading those books and the older readers were finding other edgier stuff to read because, you know, science fiction suddenly had come onto the horizon. And so 15 year olds didn't really want to watch or read the Hardy Boys. You know, they wanted to read Asimov or Clark or, you know, you know, maybe, you know, some of the other pulpier authors uh, from the, the pulp magazines and uh, Hardy Boys were, you know, a little too old school uh, for them by 1960. So they started rewriting them to aim at younger, younger readers. Well, by the 80s, the 1980s, uh, Grosset and Dunlap said, you know, we've got to dumb it down some more. And so they were writing them for eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds. And those are the versions you read, I'm almost certain, because most libraries at that point were putting those at least sort of the third, maybe even fourth revisions. And they're terrible. By comparison, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, this is all relative, you know, compared to the earlier versions, they really are not as good. Um, and, you know, this is true for Hardy Boys, for the Nancy Drew, for, I mean, they did it for all of those, those series. So back to, to Doll, it's the same thing. Um, I, I really like the idea of artistic integrity that, you know, when a, an author writes something, he or she, they're writing it in the context of the, the time period in which they existed, in which, yeah. uh, you know, whatever the social norms were, the, you know, the cultural uh, mores, the, you know, even the bad ones. And so if you make sure that the readers understand that context, then the objectional mat material isn't really a problem from my perspective. Right. But the key is providing that context, because if you're not providing the context, then it can have harmful effects um, on, on readers. And, you know, I, I think if there's too much of an effort to, to sanitize history, we actually are losing yeah. the learning, the lessons that we can gain from history um, mm -hmm. if there's too much of that scrubbing going on. So that's why I ultimately think it was not a good thing uh, for the the doll estate to do that um and yeah i think it's probably a good thing that i think they backtracked if i remember and they're now going to publish dual versions so there's going to be an original version and yeah. the revised version which i think is more appropriate because you can still provide the original as long you know as long you have the context uh you know there's a a, a, another children's book called Sign of the Beaver, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's a classic children's book uh, that um, is set in colonial times in the U.S. Um, and it involves a, a, a boy who is left alone while his parents travel off to, to go somewhere. And he's left alone for months to fend for himself. And he's like maybe... 13 years old or so. So he's not super young. He's old enough to be able to take care of himself. And he encounters a tribe of Native Americans. Uh, this is up in you know, colonial New England area. Some of the characterization in the book isn't as culturally sensitive as it probably ought to be by modern standards, by today's standards, because this book was written, I don't know, 1950s, maybe early 60s, something like that. So in the newer editions, they've kept the text intact, but they've added a foreword, an introduction that explains some of the context and I think does a nice job uh, mm -hmm. of doing that for you. So young readers can read the, the, the introduction and then understand what they're reading in the main text. And to yeah. me, that's probably the best approach. I would agree with that. I, I, that, that's pretty much my feelings as well. You said it way more elegantly than I would have. Um, Critical Dragon uh, says they aren't going to publish the original. They're going to republish the edited oh. 1970s versions. So that's a good distinction. Right, which was, that's true. They did, uh, if I remember correctly, was it the Oompa Loompas got revised for the 1970s? Uh, I mean, uh, there were some other, I don't remember all the, the details of that 70s revision, but that's a great point. 
Hmm. Great point. And Frank says, Sign of the Beaver came out in 1983. Um, I have no idea because i uh hmm. have not read it <laughs> i think i i think that's the one I'm, i i may be thinking of a different version I, there's a they all blend together for a while <laughs> I, I would say i'm we getting can, old yeah if you miss if you miss one date i think we can forgive you on that yeah. <laughs> you have a wealth of knowledge i mean you've been you've been reading a long time and that leads to being very well read which i yeah. think is, is pretty excellent so uh yeah, for those of, for, the, for, for those of you who are wondering how old I am, I'm coming up on my 40th high school reunion, so I'm actually old. Um, <laughs> and and so that you know, I, I've had a lot of opportunity to read, uh, especially since I've been reading since I was three. So uh, I, I I I get some flack sometimes in the comments, and I, I know I got some flack on a couple of Discord servers, friendly, playful flack. I'm not. This was, these are not negative things, you know, that, that, you know, I, I've read everything, which I clearly have not read everything, um, <laughs> but I, I've just had a lot of opportunity to read for many years. Yeah. I mean, you have more time, right? So yeah. that, that's what leads to, you know, to being more enlightened and also to, to more <clears throat> reading time, hopefully. Uh, Philip Chase asks, question for library letter. Have you read Malazan? If yes, what do you think of the Bridger burners? Nice I don't like Bridger burners. <laughs> uh, that that sounds like a terrible thing. Um, so, Malazan is one of those series that I I, I have incomplete opinions on, and that's partly because, well, I haven't read all of it. Uh, so, uh, around, I mean, it, it's been a while now. Uh, at least 10, maybe 12, 13 years ago, I made a decision that I rarely break. I, have, I break it every now and then, but I, I, I stuck to it pretty closely. I don't read uh, books from series that are not finished. Mm -hmm. I was one tired of getting burned by authors who wouldn't finish their series. And we all know who those suspects are. Uh, <laughs> but I also found myself running into an opportunity cost problem that you know if too much time elapses between books and a series you know when the next book comes out i'm like you know i don't quite remember all the details and most authors don't include handy synopses at the beginning of the next book in the series you know it's one of the nice things like tad williams does it and stephen r donaldson yes. does it you know they, they put these you know five or even ten page synopses of everything that has come before to refresh my memory. I'm like, oh, Except yeah, in Shadow great. March. He didn't do it in Shadow oh. March. And I was like, yeah. damn it, Dan. <laughs> Actually, on a side, I, I, I didn't remember that for Shadow March because that is the one series in my for my Tad video that I had not reread recently. Um, <laughs> I, 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 the last time I read it was when the last book in Shadow March came out. And so my discussion of that series in that video is a little sketchier simply because it had been a lot longer since I'd read it. All of the other books in the, in the video, mm -hmm. uh, I had made a point to reread more recently so that I would be fresh. And I just couldn't get the shadow March in time before I figured yeah. I really need to make this video. I need to finish it. Um, so I, I, I've actually done a lot of rereading over the last year and a half for, uh, you know, because I want to, in all of my videos, I only want to talk about books that I've actually read. Mm -hmm. And it's really helpful if I've read them fairly recently, like in the last two to three years. Um, and so anyway, uh, back to Malazan. I, I started reading Malazan I mean, 20 years ago, uh, Gardens of the Moon. I really liked Gardens of the Moon. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't a perfect book. But I was so impressed with the complexity uh, of the plotting of the world building. Uh, there were some very interesting, complex characters. Uh, and, you know, then I, I actually made it up through, I think, the third book. Uh, I might have made it to the fourth book. And it's so uneven in place. And because it's not a, a, a most people, well aware of this, but you know, it's, it's not a consistent through line narrative. I mean, it's, you're, you're seeing different parts of the world in each book and, you know, different sets of characters. And so I was 
wrestling a little bit with the uh, discontinuity uh, in those first few books. I mostly enjoyed them. There were some parts that I didn't enjoy so much. Uh, and when I discovered that it was anticipated to be a really long, you know, 10 volume series. And given how long the books are, I said, okay, I'm going to wait until it's done because I can't keep rereading these really long tomes every time a new book comes out. <laughs> uh, I mean, I did it with Wheel of Time. I mean, I've read Wheel of Time three times now. And wow. granted, I started, the first time I read it was 30 years ago, um, or at least, you know, I started reading it with, when it first came out in the early nineties. And, but you know, when the, the Sanderson books started coming out at the tail end, you know, I had to reread everything. And then there was so much going on in the final book you know, the, of, of that, uh, that I had to go back and reread them again <laughs> before I read the final book. And I was so frustrated because I enjoyed them, but that was time that I could have been reading other books. And there are so many books on my TBR uh, list that I want to get to uh, that I just said, I'll wait. The problem with Malazan is I'm still waiting. Yeah, granted, the books are done. Uh, I just have not gotten around to restarting and finishing it, Yeah, which I do want to do uh, because I, I do think highly of it. Uh, I do think it's uneven, but I've heard so many good things about where it ultimately ends up without spoilers. You know, I, I avoid spoilers, but I'm encouraged to finish it. And, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that experience. Yeah. Uh, I, and, you know, that's how I feel about, you know, I'm, you know, Stormlight Ar Archive or, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to read. I mean, I, I've read the first book in Stormlight Archive. I'm not reading any of them until it's done. Because when I heard that, you know, when, when Brandon said, you know, I anticipate this is going to be a 10 volume series. I said, heck no. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I've got too many other things to read. Uh, you know, I, I'll get to it. I like it. Um, yeah. But I, it's an opportunity cost issue uh, yeah. for me. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I, I have definitely been more into finished series. Um, now, I do buy new books still because I want to support authors and I want them to be able to put out the next book after that. You know, um, like Daniel Abraham, someone I'll buy his books oh. even if I haven't done it yet. Um, and you're, I love you're, Abraham. I, I say I you're Daniel. a big Abraham I, fan. Yeah. I, I, and, you know, on my TBR is Dagger and Coin. I, it's been on my TBR for years. Uh, but I, I read uh, Long Price Quartet years ago, loved it. Uh, I, it was, it was different in a good way. Uh, it, it, it didn't feel like so many other fantasy books that were being written at that time. Uh, I actually went through a phase probably from around 2012 to 2017, I get that five years, five or six years where I binged a lot of fantasy, particularly more recent, you know, fantasy that was written in the last 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. And there was so much sameness to a lot of it. I mean, there were so many, yeah. you know, germ knockoffs, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak, uh, you know, kind of replicating what happened with Tolkien after, you know, Tolkien got popular back in the 60s and everybody in the 70s and 80s was, you know, trying to, 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 to mimic him. I mean, there's so much that, that that Martin did that others tried to replicate and and yeah, and in many cases elaborate on. Some have done it very well. Many others. I know I've read the books, but can I remember any details about them? Very few. Uh, <laughs> they they just all blend together in this kind of muddled. Yeah, that was good. I enjoyed it. You know, I don't have bad things to say about it. At least not many bad things to say about them. But I just don't really remember them because they were so samey, samey. Mm -hmm. And so I, it, I, I, you know, I've thought about making a video about, you know, what really was the, the golden age of fantasy. And I, you know, an argument could be made that we are in the golden age of fantasy right now. I mean, there, the, the, 
the standard, the bar has been elevated. There, there really are a lot of very good works being written. And we're spoiled. Um, I mean, there's something for everybody. This is what Tad, Tad Williams said that yeah. when he was on the show. And, and I mean, I, I really like that. But there's also a lot of sameness to it. Um, yeah. And so the ones that I really like are the ones that are doing things differently. Yeah. Um, and I, the, the same is true. In fact, one of the things that I, I plan to talk about in that yet to be completed <laughs> history of fantasy video uh, is the secular, uh, the secular, it's a blend of circular and cyclical. So it, it's, uh, there's a cyclical aspect to it um, that there's this cycle of, you know, kind of innovation. And then you get a lot of imitation, you know, where people go, hey, that was cool. Let's do more of that. So you get this bandwagon of people jumping on and writing yeah. uh, things just like that. And then you get the backlash where authors go, man, I don't want to do that because everybody else is doing that. So I'm going to do something completely different or I'm going to make fun of what all of those other people are doing. I mean, I'm going to write a parody of it. <laughs> and then after they do that, that prompts more people to say, man, I don't want anybody making fun of me. I need to do something different. <laughs> and so that sprungs another round of innovation. And yeah. you know, that is actually the history of fantasy going back millennia. Uh, you know, the, you know, it, I'm sure most people uh, have, have heard of, you know, Don Quixote, uh, you know, yeah. Cervantes' classic novel. You know, it's a parody, but it's, it's, it's a parody making fun of the whole subgenre of romances, you know, the, the kind of historical romance. I mean, we're not talking lovey-dovey romance. We're talking, uh, you know, the, the epic um, stories of, of Roland and Arthur and, you know, people like that, that were very um, prevalent in the, you know, couple of hundred years before Cervantes. Well, he absolutely skewered it. <laughs> uh, and, and, and Rabelais, uh, uh, another author at that time, did a similar work, you know, absolutely making fun of it. And the whole romance subgenre, you know, just collapsed. People were like, oh, we don't want to write that anymore. Uh, and now, of course, that cycle isn't happening over hundreds of years. It's now happening over maybe a decade or, you know, 10 or 20 years where, you know, you, you see that uh, in, you know, the, the post-Tolkien effect, we had all the Tolkien imitators and that spawned people like, like Tad, who said, I don't want to be just another Tolkien imitator. So I'm going to do some things differently. Yeah. Has um, a or, you know, Glenn Cook, also even a little earlier in the early oh. 80s, you know, one of the pioneers of Grimdark. Uh, was a, a great sort of evolution of fantasy, but it was very much a reaction to, I don't want to be made fun of, you know, by people like Robert Asprin or Christopher Stachef or, you know, other, or, or, or Terry Pratchett or others who basically said, all of these Tolkien-esque tropes are just dying to be skewered. Um, yeah. So it's the same thing's happening. I think Grimdark... At least I hope will be cycling out soon. Um, uh, I think you're starting to see I, that. I, it's it's reached the end for me. I that's one of the I like aspects of it, but I, I think too many authors are making it too grim. You know, they're they're saying, oh well, you know, these previous authors they pushed the envelope. They made it even tougher, even more brutal, even more graphic, even. Yeah. more nihilistic. So how can I improve upon that? Well, let's make it even more nihilistic. You know, let's have no sympathetic characters whatsoever in this story. Everybody is terrible. I don't want to read that. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I really do not want to read that. I mean, shifting genres, uh, you know, Jillian Flynn's Gone Girl from a few years back hmm. is, is, an, is a perfect example of that. It was a huge bestseller. I don't understand why. Um, I tried reading it. I got about, I don't know, halfway through, maybe a little over halfway through it. There is not a single 
relatable, sympathetic character in that entire book. They are all mm. detestable in many respects. Uh, and I didn't want to spend time with them. I mean, this, these are, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm an immersive reader. I like spending time with characters. And even, even the flawed characters are, are nice to spend time with, yeah. as long as they're not, you know, only super terrible evil flawed characters yeah you know, I, I want to be able to identify with them at least to some extent yeah i think that that might be a symptom of something shifting in culture because if you really think about it in a lot of ways uh when you read a, something like that you know you're, these characters are terrible they're just awful people and it maybe maybe possibly makes us feel a little bit better about ourselves. And I think that mm -hmm. you can kind of see this on a, on a larger scale. If you look at reality television, reality television, a lot of times is capturing the absolute worst moments of people's lives and, and them mm -hmm. at their worst, like the peak of their terribleness. Right. Um, nobody watched the Osbournes because they were a happy family. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and kind of like uh, Tolstoy, you know, unhappy families are unhappy in different ways, kind, kind of feel and vibe to it. Um, so I, I wonder if maybe there's a comfort uh, from the, the person who's either watching or reading or, um, the material to say, well, at least I'm not this bad. At least I'm not in this situation or, or, or like this person. Uh, I've, I've, I've always felt that way about reality television. If you want to take a step further, mm -hmm. I mean, you can just look at websites who curate terrible, uh, public freak out videos like live leak or public freak out on Reddit or whatever it might be. And really what those videos are, are capturing people at their lowest moments. And I think maybe we're addicted to that. It, it, it seems very exploitative. Uh, and I, I, to, to, Go back to children's books, using it as, a, as an example here. Mm -hmm. I think it actually changes how we think. Um, I, you know, I'll share in a, a, a comment that my daughter shared with me, you know, when she was a sixth grader. So this was that book club I was telling you about. And so she was a member of the club. And, you know, the year that she was in the club, they read 15 books. And I think of those 15 books, at least maybe 12 of them, I, I actually added up the stats at the time. I don't remember exactly what they were. At least 12 of the books had as a major plot point in them, bullying. Mm. And, you know, at the time there was a lot of attention just in the wider culture about childhood bullying and the, the harmful effects it can have and, you know, why we need to be more attentive to it and, and try to prevent it, which I think is a wonderful thing, you know, not bullying, but preventing it. And, but she pointed out to me that if all they're reading are these books that are, you know, kids who are 10 years old, 11 years old, they're reading these books that describe situations where these kids the, the characters in the books are having horrible experiences that life is miserable for them at school or at home. And, and, you know, and, and many of these books are actually trying to teach valuable lessons, you know, lessons of inclusion, lessons of, of tolerance, you know, they're, they're, so I, I get what the, the authors were trying to do, mm -hmm. but when the librarians selected these 15 books for inclusion, they didn't include very many, positive books, yeah. you know, the books that show what life can be like. It, mm -hmm. And so my daughter was saying it kind of normalizes this experience and makes it seem as if, well, this is just what school is like. This is just how kids behave. And it almost was a, an instruction manual for many kids who read it who thought, oh, well, I want to be like the bully because the bully actually has the power, <laughs> has the power here. And if right. that's all you're reading that demonstrates bullying and doesn't show behavior that kids can actually model, yeah. what are you teaching the kids? And, uh, and, and this was, this was my, my, you know, 12 year old daughter, 11 year old, I don't remember how old she was, but, you know, commenting on it. And they, I paused and went, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, if, if you're normalizing it in that way, and, and I have the same problem with like a lot of YA fiction, 
uh, particularly like the dystopian stuff uh, that just, I, I, I was horrified by the Hunger Games. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that as a, you know, some, you know, prude or, you know, you know, a, a, a cultural scold. That's not where I'm coming <laughs> from. I, what, what horrified me was third graders and fourth graders were reading the Hunger Games at my kid's school. And I assume many people watching this uh, have read the Hunger Games. It's very violent. And it's, you know, kids killing other kids. I don't think that's a spoiler. I don't like talking about spoilers, but that's essentially the main plot point is, you know, a government sponsored child massacre. Yeah. It's terrible <laughs> in terms of what are we teaching nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds who read this, uh, you know, or, you know, Neil Schusterman's uh, Scythe series, yeah. which I think is well-written, but you've got 10 year olds reading it. That is not because, because most of the time in these books, problems are not being solved by thoughtful problem solving. You know, they're, they're not figuring out ways to fix things except with violence. Violence yeah. is the answer in a lot of those dystopian YA books. And it teaches nine and 10 year olds who are not mature enough, who don't have the life experience, who don't have the perspective uh, and whose, you know, just brain chemistry is not stable at that age, that violence is good and violence is, is appropriate. Um, hmm. And I'm saying this to a professional wrestler. So uh, <laughs> this is very ironic, uh, uh, but I, I, I was, you know, again, I'm not, criticizing the Hunger Games itself, I'm more criticizing the impact that it and its ilk yeah. might have had on a whole generation of readers. And what is that doing for their ability to cope as adults with hmm. difficult situations, with you know, being able to handle conflict, being able to handle disagreements, uh, you know, being able to just solve problems. Yeah. Uh, particularly when a lot of these dystopians are so badly thought out. <laughs> um, they're, they're completely illogical. They, there's no historical coherence. I mean, you, you, I mean, hunger game, I'm just, I can't imagine a way for that whole society to have evolved in the time that it did. I, there, there's no logical path to get to that point. I mean, the, the author essentially created a scenario and just waved her hands to say, you don't even think about how we got to this point because it would never get to that point. We, we just want you to imagine this scenario. But for me, it's difficult to, to suspend disbelief. Uh, yeah. I'm a little too rational. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's particularly, I think, endemic in, in dystopian fiction, but a lot of fantasy fiction has the same problem. You know, the world building is very superficial. You know, the economics of world building are largely ignored uh, and I, I hate that, you know, where things happen or that, you know, they describe a culture or they describe all these neighboring kingdoms or duchies or things that have completely different economies. They're not integrated in ways that make any sense. And yet they're supposed to be sustainable in ways that are highly unlikely. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm a student of history. I love, yeah looking at how history actually evolves, how civilizations actually, uh, you know, progress and, and learn from one another and, you know, how value is created that allows, uh, you know, civilizations to flourish. Um, and most writers don't do that. And yeah. it really makes it hard. Uh, it's one of my biggest knocks on the wheel of time is the world building just for me is incoherent, uh, completely nonsensical. As much as I love how elaborate it is, I, I, I have to knock it down a few points um, just because it's a little excessive and illogical. Yeah, I, th I do think that that's one of the bigger challenges for like uh, sci-fi and fantasy, especially fantasy, is that there are more risk of pulling the person out of the fictive dream, as John Gardner mm -hmm. would say, um, because of things like that, right? Like you can't account for everything. 
Um, so it, it, it's tough. I think Le Guin actually does a really nice job of balancing things and, and her world building in Earthsea, which uh, interestingly enough, starts out very young and then kind of develops with its reader. But I was always impressed with her minor details about economy and, and many other things. Uh, Carl has a really good question that you would be oh. probably able to answer not me but he says was lord of the flies the archetype of modern YA dystopias certainly one of them hmm. uh, i'm trying to think of you know what might have come before it that would have been equally influential and i'm struggling to think of one that would have had the same degree of impact yeah. uh, uh, that, that 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 that's a good uh, a good one to, to select for that, for that role. Um, that's yeah. a tough book. I, I, I couldn't believe, you know, my daughter read that in sixth grade, maybe. Yeah. Seventh school grade. Reading. I mean, yeah. I, I, I thought at the time, I don't think I would assign this to a 11 year old. I just, I, I read it in high school. Um, uh, and for me, it's more age appropriate for high school just because of you know, some of the themes in it, because again, it, it, what lessons is it actually teaching? Now, in her case, she was reading it with guidance from a teacher. So of course the teacher was able to provide context and, yeah. you know, lessons and, um, you know, but if, you know, a, a 10 year old is reading it on their own, unguided, hmm. you know, I don't know about that. Yeah. And maybe, you know, that's why it would be school reading, right? Is that yeah. hopefully someone could guide them through it. Um, you know, speaking of mm -hmm. kind of like bullying being involved and whenever everything kind of goes this one way that it can influence things. Like one thing that I do forget at times is that like not everyone has had a tragic life and tragic things happen to them. Like some people can actually identify with what people would consider like a cozier story or a happier yeah. story. And not everyone goes through those things. So they, it might not actually be the, the normal thing to go through. And, and a, a example of this is my friend Ben read uh, Realm of the Elderlings and he came mm -hmm. out at the end of it and he said, I don't really know if that was really worth my time, which broke my heart because I love Realm of the Elderlings. Uh, but one of the key things about Realm of the Elderlings is how emotionally attached I am to certain things that happen in that series and like seeing forgiveness play out and, and guilt and all these uh, really incredible things in my opinion. But you know, we, me and him were talking, uh, I was in a large group chat setting, but me and him were talking about it and I kind of expressed like why it meant so much to me. And he was like, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I did not have those experiences, those traumatic experiences that you had. Mm -hmm. So like, to me, you know, it almost seems irrational. I don't know if he actually said irrational, but you know, he's like, that, that might be one of the reasons like I haven't, I haven't lived that kind of experience. So for me that there's no attachment to that. And it's like, oh yeah, like, you know, even in, for me, I like live in this bubble where I'm like, oh, yeah, not everyone's like nihilistic like I am. <laughs> like not everyone's so <laughs> pessimistic. Uh, it, you know, I, I would say that I'm definitely guilty of that. And one of the reasons why I always read above my age level is because the books in school that I would read even in fifth grade, I remember were very positive in tone. But I was always a troubled kid as far as like internal thoughts. I always I had some very dark thoughts when I was like 11 and 12 years old and something I struggled with. I didn't realize I was struggling, I, I guess I should say, because I was so young. But when I would read things that were off limits and more adult, I would find more of those type of stories. And I actually found comfort in that. Like I didn't feel as I didn't feel as weird, I guess, because everyone around me was always so happy and I never understood why I wasn't happy. So a book that had a lot more uh, I got negative tone, maybe a pessimistic tone, like almost made me feel a little bit more normal. If that, yeah. if that makes any sense. Well, I, I think it's, it's great to read a variety of things. Um, you know, my, yeah. the, the, the concern that I voiced and that my, my daughter voiced was for that book club, it was too much of the same thing and she wanted more yeah, of a variety. mix yeah. that could, could d provide different perspectives because we all have different lived experiences. And so yeah. it gives us an opportunity to see things through different people's eyes. But if you're only seeing one kind of slanted negative perspective, that's when you, it creates more of a problem, uh, particularly with young, you know, more moldable minds. But if you're giving them you know, exposure to different 
perspectives. Uh, I, I think that's you know where you have a mix of the positive, yeah. the the happy, the 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 aspirational types of of stories that give you know people who may not have experienced that type of life growing up. It gives them something to shoot for. It says, okay, this yeah. is possible because there are people who do have this, uh, and it gives them something that maybe they can uh, can can aim for. Um, while at the same time, people who have had relatively sheltered, happy upbringings can maybe develop more empathy by reading about tougher tales. Um, yeah. you know, the, some of the experiences that people have had, you know, that are completely foreign to them. Um, yeah. and, and I, 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 I like that kind of varied exposure. I've like noticed it. a couple of, of comments here. Uh, Carl wants me to do a Kim Stanley Robinson. Yes, it's in the queue. Um, I, I am a big fan of, of Robinson. He's, he's kind of a mixed bag. I can't say I love everything he's written, but I have just about everything that he's written and have read just about all of it. Uh, the, the Mars trilogy is awesome. Uh, uh, it's, it's not for everybody, for example, but boy, some of the very best hard sci-fi ever written in my opinion. Um, wow. It is, if you want to deep dive in the actual science of how to colonize Mars, <laughs> as well as the political dimensions of mounting a multinational effort to colonize another planet, um, it's fantastic. Um, some of the character work's a little funky, but it's, I mean, great. Great stuff. Uh, in terms of, if you want intellectual stimulation, it's got it. Uh, I, 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 I love that. Um, and I see uh, Michael wants to know how it's how you know booktubing has affected my my future reading plans. So I, yes. I alluded to it a little bit that I'm doing a lot of rereads these days. <laughs> That's great, though. That's so fun because because I want to refresh before I talk about all of these books. Uh, so I am actually falling farther behind on my TBR <laughs> list <laughs> uh, since uh, starting the, the channel. Uh, I don't I don't begrudge that. I'm, I I enjoy rereading these books, um, mm -hmm. and you know it's why I choose the authors or you know books that I talk about. Is I talk about books I like, um, yeah. and authors that I like and that I want to share with people that I that I I, I think deserve more attention. And you know that's that's kind of how I prioritize things. Uh, so rereading them is is a great experience. Right now, I'm in the middle of a giant reread of Jack Vance. Um, nice, because I have a, I have an upcoming Jack Vance retrospective. Uh, he is such an idiosyncratic writer uh, and thinker, and I I I love his works. He's a little bit of an acquired taste. Um, but it's really fun reading them in this reread because, you know, I've read Vance over a 40 year period, probably, or more than 40 years, but it's been kind of sporadic, you know, a little yeah. bit here, a little bit there. I'm actually going almost start to finish and seeing his full many decade writing career at once. And it's both a wonderful experience and a not so wonderful experience. Um, he Start has to see certain, some quirks and stuff. So, so, well, so he has certain quirks, certain ticks that show up in almost everything he writes. Hmm. And it becomes a little bit repetitive when you're reading them back to back to back to back to back. But if you're spreading them out, it's not as noticeable. And it's, it's a lot yeah. of fun. Um, but I can also see how he has evolved as a, you know, he's not yeah. with us, so he's not, I'm talking in the present tense, but, you know, how he evolved as a writer. Um, he was so prolific. I mean, his goal was a million words a year writing. And Jeez. some years he hit that. Uh, wow. And he, his early stuff, some of it's really rough. Um, some of it is incredibly creative. I mean, most of it's actually very creative. Yeah, I would say that's his strength. His his world building is both very elaborate and very Spartan at the same time. <laughs> he figures out what are the essential defining elements of a world or of a culture, 
and he focuses on those things. So you have a clear idea. This is what makes this culture tick. And then he moves on because his, his books, for the most part, until he got late in his career, his books are really, really very short. I mean, he wrote short novels and a lot of, you know, short you know, stories and novellas. Um, but he's able to capture those essential elements of, of, of the world building so concisely and, and so cleverly uh, and messily at times uh, in his early <laughs> stuff. But when you get to his later stuff, wow. Um, hmm. On the fantasy side, Leon S is one of my favorites. I mean, the, the Leon S trilogy, highly recommended. It so it's, it's, it's very idiosyncratic. Uh, it the first book, uh, Soldier's Garden, doesn't make a whole lot of sense in places because he's he's jumping around different points of view, characters, just different parts of the world. Different. I mean, it's it's not clear how things fit together. Then halfway through the book, it takes a huge left turn or right turn. I mean, it just pivots in a completely unexpected direction, and you're you're sort of left with whiplash going, where is this book going? What, what is happening here? <laughs> I highly you know, recommend stick with it because okay. all of these disparate pieces, he ties them all together in the next two books. And it's not until Madhuk, the third book, that you really understand how hmm. things fit together. And it's, 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 it's lovely, it's quirky, it is funny. His, his sense of humor is so sly. Uh, it's it's not laugh out loud funny. It's not Pratchett humor, where you know Pratchett's a little over the top. Vance is subtle and mm. sneaky. Um, he his characters tend to be very. Everybody's looking to exploit everyone else in some way, shape, or form. I mean, there are. Uh, but, but, but many of these characters actually mean well. I mean, they're, they're basically decent characters, but they're trying either to take advantage of a situation or they're trying to avoid being taken advantage. Mm -hmm. And he, it, 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 it's, it's a, I mean, just a tremendous amount of fun. It's a different reading experience. Um, he has another uh, of one of his later science fiction uh, uh, series, uh, the, the Cadwall trilogy, um, Araminta Station, um, uh, Eki and Troy were the three books. Very well done, much longer books than his early stuff, mm -hmm. uh, where he really was coming into his own as a writer. He still has some of the same quirks, but it's a lot more polished, you know, like Leoness, a lot. Uh, you know, the writing style is, is also just even more enjoyable, you know, a little yeah. less Spartan. Yeah. I uh, highly I recommend Vance. I read the first dying earth and I came out of it going, well, that was wild. Like that was my, it, I was like, this guy is a wild writer. He just. D you know, dying earth. I mean, that was one of his early. Well, works. it was Pulp first, it, right? It wasn't it oh, like, yes. yeah. Oh, he was, he was a big pulp writer and you know, the stories, it's really more of a, a bunch of separate, some yeah. of them are sort of linked short stories. Yeah. Uh, but it's not really a novel. It, it's a, more of a collection of stories. Yeah. The middle two books in the Dying Earth sequence, uh, the, uh, the Eyes of the Overworld, and I don't know if it's Kugel's Saga or Kugel's. Uh, I, I have different audiobooks that one pronounces it Kugel and the other pronounces it Kugel. You know, I, I assumed it was always Kugel, when I was reading the books you know, years ago for the first time, but when I heard the audiobook narrator, who, and it was a you know a professional narrator who I assume you know did his homework and tried to figure out you know what is the proper pronunciation, he pronounced it Kugel. So if anybody actually knows what the proper pronunciation is, I you know love to know what that is, what Vance actually intended. So whatever it is, Kugel or Kugel is saga. Those two books I think are the heart of the Dying Earth because. They really do focus on the misadventures of one character, Kugel. And he's as a he, scoundrel. And it's, it's, it, he's a scoundrel, but he's he's not a bad character. I mean, he, oh, no. he, he's a bit of a con artist, but 
when things really get down and dirty, he does try to do the right thing. Um, yeah. He's he's a he's a sympathetic and an empathetic character, and he's a blowhard. And he's but he's also clever. I mean, that's his nickname. He's Kugel the clever, but he's not quite as clever as he thinks he is. I love those stories, um, and and it's a collection of short stories, but they're they're connected. Uh, there is actually a narrative through line that ties them all together over those two books. Um, I, I really think that's that's the best part of the Dying Earth sequence, and uh, you know I, I I I definitely recommend them. You know, the first book has its moments, but it's a little more hit and miss, um, at least from my perspective. Yeah, it, but that's, for me, that's was, what I that's what I'm doing a lot of reading. That's awesome. I, I I thought it was a good sample, and then everyone said the books two and three are really good. So I need to get back to it because um, I did like Vance, and he was a huge inspiration for George R. R. Martin, which is like my favorite author. So I like going back in time and and checking things out. And one of those people is Tad Williams. And if we don't talk about Tad Williams, I'm going to have a lot of upset people because I am a massive Tad lover. And then you put out the best Tad video that has ever been made, um, which I was so happy to see. Uh, T talk a little bit about Tad Williams and like when you were making that video, like, was that one of the videos you knew you had to make? Oh, completely. I, my list of videos that I plan to make is five years long. Uh, I mean, it, but that's partly because I'm a slow, I, it takes me a while to make videos. So <laughs> I, it's perfect. But I, I have, there are many authors that I absolutely want to talk about. Uh, Martin is one except I don't really plan to talk about uh, Song of Ice and Fire Fever because dream. that's already widely covered on book two. But he wrote so much mm -hmm. for decades before yeah. he ever wrote uh, A Game of Thrones. And, and I have, you know, nearly all of what he's written uh, before Game of Thrones and I've read nearly all of it. And it's worth reading for the most part. Uh, and it's not really discussed for the most part on, on BookTube. So I, I have that in my list. Uh, you know, there, uh, but back to Tad, I, Tad has been one of my absolute favorite fantasy authors for a very long time. But, and he writes more than just fantasy. I mean, he, you know, his Otherland uh, tetralogy is one of my favorite science fiction series uh, that I've, I've, wow. I've read. Uh, I, you know, I first read it back in the 90s when it came out, and I just was blown away uh, by, you know, how he was imagining technology to evolve. And as I mentioned in the video, you know, rereading it now, and I did reread it uh, a couple of years ago, it's amazing how prescient it was. Uh, he's describing things that actually have come to pass, even though he set his... That you know that that series many decades in the future from where we are now. I mean, it yeah. was I don't remember 2060, 2070, or somewhere in that time frame, uh, where we are almost certainly going to get to that point well before I think 2060 or 2070, if we follow the trajectory that we're on. Uh, so, so Tad has long been on my list. Um, I had hoped to do a Tad video last year. I just you know, I kept putting it off, off because Tad kept delaying the, the release of his, you know, the, the concluding volumes of uh, Last King of Ostinard. Uh, due to, I mean, the pandemic, I think, slowed down his his writing and, and publication schedule. And, yeah. and, you know, I really wanted to uh, have read those books before making the Tad video. Um, but I, I finally, you know, said, okay, I do need to make this video. And I'm just gonna not have read the last book, uh, The Navigator's Children, because well, it hasn't come out yet, but it is coming out later this year. Yeah. So what do you want to know about Tad? I, well, it did get delayed a little bit. Oh, it's not. It's so, not a game. It, it doesn't set, look like it's going to come out this year. Yeah, biggest oh, disappointment, no. dude. Like literally, my number one thing. I was gonna make a video in July and say this: the thing I'm most excited for this year, and it was gonna be all about Last King of Ostenard, and it got delayed again. So, I haven't started those I, sequels yet. Uh, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn was very much a formative read for me when I read it. You know, thirty years ago, 
uh, for the first time. I, I struggled with the first 150 pages, just like many readers. It's a little slow to, to start off. Um, you spend a lot of time in the hay holt, the, you know, the, the castle uh, there in the, you know, where the, the, the king's seat is. There's a lot of things that you're not quite sure, okay, what's the point of all of this? Mm -hmm. And you get to it. I mean, eventually when you read the full series, you're like, oh, I, now I understand what Tad was doing. Uh, you know, all yeah. of the exposition, all of the, all of the background that he was providing there at the beginning makes sense later in the book. Yeah. It is a little bit, a little bit sluggish for me the first time I read it. It picks up substantially from there uh, and it just gets progressively better, um, I thought, as it went along. It's funny, I, I had some changes in my reaction to... Uh, Memory, hmm. Sorrow, and Thorn across different rereads. So I think I've probably read it three times now um, wow. over 30 years. And the first time I had, there were very few faults that I could find in it. I mean, it was one of the very first, maybe even the first serious fantasy work that included religion, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. there were things, I mean, the world building included elements that just hadn't been incorporated in anything that I had read prior to that point. And I, I thought it was fascinating. Uh, and I enjoyed the characters, but I didn't really think too much about them. Mm -hmm. uh, I was probably more focused on plot than character at that point in my life. And, you know, plot and world building. On subsequent rereads, I've focused more on the character work. And some of it I've really enjoyed even more than I did previously. Some of it I haven't enjoyed as much. Uh, I, mm. I've i become a little less happy with some of his female characters in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn on, on rereads. Um, uh, Miriam L. didn't bother me much the first reread, or the first time I read it. But this last reread I did prior to making the video, I got annoyed by her. Really? Um, I, I thought that she should, I thought I, I, I wanted her to behave a little differently. Um, mm -hmm. I thought she was a little too headstrong and impetuous in stupid ways. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he does and, write stupid characters. <laughs> Simon is the dumbest. <laughs> I, 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 and, and, and just, there were times when she was a little just too whiny and bratish and um, entitled in a way that didn't quite fit what I thought hmm. would have been more realistic given um, what I assumed was her upbringing. Uh, and and how her character, I assumed, should have evolved over time, just from the experiences she has in the series. You know, I thought that she would learn lessons and change, and she didn't quite change in ways that I, I think I would have expected her to. Yeah, that's just me. I I, I didn't hate her character. I'm I'm not uh, doing that. And then there's uh, Prince Joshua's consort slash wife, and I don't remember her name off the top of my head either who was just a little too maybe shrewish. Um, again, not over the top, but just maybe a little too one note-ish. You know, it's like, she's really, I'm sure, a more complex character in the story. And I would have liked a little more complexity in her character. Um, and probably from Maria Mel as well. Vorteva, that's right. Thank you for the, uh, for the note. Nice, thanks Ryan. Uh, and so when I, I get to the last King of Ostinard, yeah, Elias probably not the best dad. <laughs> <laughs> He's not winning any dad of the year awards. But Joshua, yeah, Joshua is 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 a much better role model in many respects, maybe not all. But the last King of Ostinard, I don't want to spoil it for you, so since you haven't started it, uh, but I had been holding off reading it because my rule is I'm not going to read something until it's finished and. You know, I broke that rule for Last King of Austin Art. I started reading it last year so in preparation for this, this TAD video. At first, I didn't, 
well, I started with the the first prequel, um, The Heart of What Was Lost. Yes. And I was I was lost for the first part of, of reading because <laughs> it's told from the the standpoint of the Norns, you know, who were the antagonists mm -hmm. in Memory Sorrow and Thorn. And it's set um, during that interim between the end of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn and the start of Last King of Ostinard. Yeah. And some of the Norns are presented very sympathetically. And there's a whole world building and culture building that goes on in that short, I don't know if it's a novella or maybe just a very, very short novel. Mm -hmm. That was unexpected. And I had to kind of get my bearings because the Norns are kind of presented as in, in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn as just a big, bad, evil, yeah. monolithic culture that just needs, you know, that, that just wants to destroy humanity, you know, which is, of course, kind of a, a stereotype. Uh, and Tad just demolishes that stereotype and then presents the Norn culture as much more complex, much more fragmented um, in terms of the, the perspectives and attitudes. And not everyone agrees with uh, what, you know, the, the leaders of the Norn society want. Um, and uh, it's very, there's a lot of kind of political machination going on in that, that short novel. And I had to kind of wrap my head around rethinking also Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, because it adds a completely different uh, perspective to yeah. what happens in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. So after reading that, I, I was guardedly optimistic. I thought, okay, this is really interesting. I like this. Mm -hmm. I want to see where it goes. So then I, I read the first full novel um, in Last King of Ostinard. And for the first hundred pages or so, I didn't really like it. I was, no. I was getting very uh, alarmed because, and this was mainly character work. You know, Simon and Mary Mel, yes, they survive Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. So that's a spoiler, but I don't think it's, you know, a big spoiler. Uh, but their characters, they're now older. Uh, you know, they've aged 35 years or you know, something like that. Uh, and they don't appear to have learned anything in those oh, 35 gosh. years. Oh, They're gosh. the same teenage characters they were in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. And I was annoyed. Uh, I, I just, I, I, I liked other aspects of what Tad was doing with the world building and, and some of the other characters that were being introduced. But Simon and Miriamel, just, I, 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 I did not have a good feeling. <laughs> I did yeah. not have a good feeling. And it made me very, 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 very nervous. I was getting major Thomas Covenant flashback vibes to his, you know, the final Thomas Covenant uh, uh, chronicles, which were disastrous. Um, you know, I just, I, I really, it's one of the few books that I actively dislike. You know, because I always try to find things I like about books, even if I ultimately don't really prefer the book. I always look for the good. Mm -hmm. Those books I really struggle to find the good in. I, there is some good, but bad really overwhelms it. But with this first book in Ostinard, I was going, oh, please don't let this be a disaster. It gets better, though. Oh, oh when you were scaring pivots, me. I'm not going to lie. Like, I was like, when he pivots to the Norns again, when he pivots to the, uh, the city, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, and the Norns in the city are sort of elfin like races that are rivals, you know, they're, they're closely related, you know, sort of like dark elves and light elves kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And, but the relationship is actually a lot more complex than that there. It's not dark and light. It's, lots of shades of gray and there's a whole backstory to their histories that are barely hinted at in Memory, Sorrow and Thorn that get explored in a lot more detail in Austin Ard. And I love it. 
Beautiful. Um, I am really happy with what he did in the series, as much as I still continue to dislike what he did with Simon and Miriam L. And I, I just tolerate those sections of the, the novels. Uh, the rest of it more than makes up. Um, and, Good. you know, I, I, I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. Um, and I hope I haven't planted the seed in your mind to hate Simon and Miriam L because you might completely. Well, I, so um, I've only read them once. I read November Song Thor once. Right. <laughs> so I, uh, I was just kind of lost in what was happening. So I probably didn't pick up on little things. I, I do remember liking Maramel quite a bit though. And even her kind of boldness and her stubbornness, mm -hmm. I kind of liked it. Um, so I'll be curious to see what I think whenever, whenever I get to see them um, in their new existing form. And I need a release date, Tad. Give me a release date, man. Because as soon as you do, I can start my reread. Um, Fit to be read. Mike says, thank you uh, for the great entertainment tonight, Jimmy. So great to see this great conversation with both of you. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. It's very generous of you. Um, and as always, whenever someone uh, donates, uh, you get a special message from Bobby Baratheon himself. Thank you so much for the super chat. By the old gods and the new, I bless you. I will use this money now to get another tankard of ale. So thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate it. Bobby B, thanks you. Uh, it'll get him another uh, six pack. Uh, he drinks Miller Lite. Um, that's that's what we have here uh, <laughs> where I'm at. Uh, we did have a couple other questions for you that I wanted to definitely go over. Um, sure. I know we're, get, know we're getting. Uh, I'm, I'm here for whatever the whatever the long haul is. Uh, I, <laughs> I I actually took a nap this afternoon and I've been drinking coffee here. So uh, <laughs> you're wired and ready to go. <laughs> I'll, I'll stick a lot, I'll stick around as long as anybody uh, wants to talk. Wonderful. Brian's ask, uh, I have a question for the library ladder with your love for GGK and his fiction being basically historical fiction with a fantasy uh, bend. What do you think of Bernard Cornwell? Uh, he is my favorite historical fiction author. I have an entire shelf up here. That's all Bernard Cornwell. I have a retrospective video that I plan to make of yeah. All of his series, uh, I have read just about everything he's ever written, even his trashy and not very good mystery novels. He may he wrote mystery <laughs> thrillers, you know, modern day mystery thrillers. Uh, you know, he has a love of sailing, for example, and so he would write these, you know, boat related, sailing related, you know, modern day thrillers stick to the historical stuff. Uh, <laughs> he it, tried. It, yeah. And, and his standalones, even his, his, his standalone historical novels are not his best work. Um, hmm. But some of his series are fantastic. Um, you know, I, I love the Sharp series. I love the, uh, the, the Utrecht series mm -hmm. uh, that starts with the last kingdom. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, his grail quest, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, but I say the grail quest one is actually my favorite starter entry point. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a trilogy that uh, is not the King Arthur one, uh, the warlord, not warlords, warlords. Which, okay. which is, which is great. Uh, yeah. uh, but the grail quest is set during, I think the hundred year war, um, uh, between oh. France and England. Yeah. And, you know, it's told from the perspective of a soldier in that war, and it's it's a great, uh, great easy read trilogy. I mean, it's it's not as heavy and and dark and deep as Warlord Chronicles, but talk about fun escapism. Yeah, great entry point, and it's only three books long, so you don't have to. It's not like Sharp, where you're like, there are twenty. <laughs> Three books in the Sharp series. Now, granted, they're you can kind of read them as standalones, but yeah. Uh, and and even the Utrecht one has probably gone on longer than I would prefer it to go on. Uh, I hear they get I, I love the, I, I love the Utrecht ones, but mm -hmm. I actually haven't read the most recent ones because I, I mean that's a good way of putting it. They they started getting a little bit repetitive, and I, I thought he could have. I thought he could have told the story in like the first six or seven books. Um, yeah. And I don't know what we're on now, 10, 11 or I, whatever. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, but I really like it. I, and even just, if you just read the first three or four, they're great reads. Um, nice. And you learn so much about warfare 
at that time point and the politics and 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 the kind of the religious politics going on um, at that 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 time period. I mean, probably the only series that has been I've been indifferent about with Cornwell are his uh, Starbuck Chronicles, uh, the Civil War era mm -hmm. one. And, I mean, it's not bad, uh, but it just is not my favorite. It's probably my least favorite of, of all of them. And I've just spoiled my entire retrospective of Bernard Cornwell that I, that I, <laughs> I will probably make a, a 45 or 50 minute video. And I just encapsulated it in three or four minutes. Uh, this is the, this is the elevator pitch. pitch. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. I love uh, Cornwell. I love historical fiction. Although I, I will say the best historical fiction that I have ever read is by a science fiction writer. Uh, and that's Neil Stevenson's Baroque Cycle. Uh, uh, I, I is, that is just a maddeningly fascinating read. Is it perfect? No, it has its absolute weak spots. But, oh, you are going to learn stuff when you read that book or those books, the, the, the three volumes, and you're going to be entertained as well. There are, there are characters that are so unique uh, and, and he incorporates real life, I mean, real historical figures into the story in ways that make me want to go back in time and meet them. Um, I, 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 I find, I mean, I find Isaac Newton to be an insufferable, I won't say it, uh, this is a family channel, uh, <laughs> but, you know, and his rival, uh, uh, Leibniz, you know, a German mathematician and polymath is fascinating. I'd love to meet Leibniz. Uh, in fact, reading the Baroque cycle uh, triggered some of my book collecting. You know, I, I had collected some nonfiction book prior to that. You know, I love early travel logs from, you know, like the 19th century where, you know, this was right and when people could in fact travel the world. You know, they could get on a, yeah. a sailing ship and visit exotic ports. Uh, different parts of the world, and then they'd write about them. And they'd write, they'd publish books, and you know, have these illustrated editions of, "Hey, this is what Egypt is like," or "This is what Polynesia is like," and and I, I think it's fascinating. And I have quite a few of those types of, of books. But the Baroque cycle is set back in the late 1600s and early 1700s. You know, during that, right at that pivot point. Age of exploration is going on, but you also get the age of enlightenment and rational mm. thinking. And, you know, the, you know, that's, uh, was the point in time that uh, sort of marked the death knell for the early fantasy genre. You had people basically saying, hey, science is king. You know, all of this fantasy stuff, this superstitious stuff, it's fake. You can't mm. believe it. Interesting. Because uh, it, it's amazing to see how he melds that conflict between superstition and science and the evolution of a lot of what we take for granted today, both science, economics. I mean, he, he basically walks you through the evolution of the banking system and monetary policy and all of these things that are normally think of as being really dry and dull. And I say that as someone who is trained as an economist. Uh, but he <laughs> he makes it fascinating because he puts it in historical context in ways that, for me at least, were really gripping and made made me want to learn more. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's when I got a little more aggressive in trying to track down, you know, early copies of those very books that people were reading in the 1600s and 1700s to learn about science or learn about the world. Uh, and anyway, I love historical fiction. It's a, it's an area that I have not focused on on my channel yet. I do plan to, uh, I, I have been wrestling with the algorithm because the <laughs> algorithm, the algorithm thinks I'm a fantasy channel and I love fantasy and I've done a lot of fantasy content, but my, 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 two early Guy Gabriel K videos completely skewed my <laughs> subscriber base, skewed the algorithm. 
So every channel or every video I make, it assumes is a fantasy video. Um, but when I made, for example, a, a video last fall about the, the, the roots of the spy fiction genre, yeah. know, early spy fiction, one of my favorite videos that I've made, it crashed and burned because you know, YouTube kept showing it to fantasy readers and fantasy readers are like, meh, not my stuff. You know, not, not, yeah. not, not, not what I want to read, not what I want to hear about. Yeah. And, and that's, that's fine. Um, but I know there's an audience out there for that video, but, but YouTube doesn't want to show it. Uh, and so that one, uh, and, 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 you know, I, my children's videos, uh, children's book videos are the worst performing of all of my videos as much as I love making those videos. Um, so I've, I've been slowly adding a little more variety, a little by little, a little bit of mm -hmm. horror, a little bit of mystery, a little, because I read widely. I read all, all genres um, and I enjoy all genres. Um, and I want to talk about all genres. YouTube doesn't want me to talk about all genres. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I, I'm getting there. Um, yeah. To uh, I'm, and you know the advice that I've 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 learned. I don't know how valid the advice is from these YouTube experts, you know, <laughs> other YouTube channels who know the insides of the algorithm. Like, oh, maybe, maybe not. You know, <laughs> yeah. they, they, their 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 advice to me essentially is just keep making videos, and as you keep diversifying your videos, eventually the algorithm will recognize that oh, your target audience isn't this narrow niche, it's this broader audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably true. Um, just yeah. my, back, my background in statistics tells me it needs a larger sample size, more data to be able to figure out yeah. who my audience ought to be. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, imagine how confused people were that subscribed back to when this was a wrestling channel. Uh, they were probably very confused when I put up a book review in 2020. They were like, <laughs> why is he wearing a shirt? <laughs> uh, yeah. and you weren't flexing on camera yeah um, where's the baby or, or were you maybe, maybe yeah. you were i don't know i didn't see those very early ones it depends on the video you know <laughs> i'm gonna be the first booktuber with an only fans account that's my goal um <laughs> Um, Kev has a question. Has mr ladder which is phenomenal uh oh. ever read any peter f hamilton i have uh he is another author I plan to do a retrospective of. I have not read everything by him. Um, and so but I, before I make these retrospectives, I try to make sure that I have read everything so that I can talk about it uh, knowledgeably. Uh, but he's one of those authors who can be a difficult author to read uh, because, you know, it's very dense. It's very, they're very long. Um, very cerebral, um, but if I'm in the right frame of mind, I mean, I've, I've read Night's Dawn, for example, uh, great, I loved it, but I could see why people would hate it. I mean, I can, I can, I can understand why it's absolutely not for everybody. Uh, and I can't say that I loved every aspect of it. Um, I think I would have liked it if it were a little shorter. Um, it was a little overwritten from, from my perspective. But I, I, I think it was a, just a, a monumental accomplishment. Um, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for Hamilton uh, as an author uh, and, and want to get to more of his, his works uh, so that I can do that uh, retrospective. I have a, a few books that I need to get to. Yeah. I, uh, I haven't read any Peter F. Hamilton, but I've been having a lot of people around me read Peter F. Hamilton, mm -hmm. which is always a good way of getting me to read something because uh, I feel like I'm missing out. And I've heard that he has just some out there things that happen in his books like like you wouldn't believe. And whenever there's authors that are taking risks and doing weird stuff like I'm pretty much in. That's how I know I'm going to love Clyde yeah. Barker uh, when I finally read Weave World. I'm going to it's going to be right up my alley, I think. But oh, Bar Barker is one of the authors who is an enormous gap in my reading. Uh, mm -hmm, me too. And uh, you know, Baron at Your Brain on Books, who, by the way, needs to come back and start making more videos. Baron, he's the one introduced watching. me to you. He's he's the I one know. who like, he's like, I'm trying I, to get him on Discord. You got to have him on Chatting with Nuts. I, like he was the originator. <laughs> I, I, I love Baron's reviews. I mean, one of the most thoughtful Agreed. 
reviewers of books uh, on BookTube. And I, I, I mean, I know he's, you know, he's a dad now and he wants to spend time with, you know, you know, young, young, young child, completely get it. But, you know, this is my appeal to Baron. Please come back. Uh, uh -huh. I, I, I'd, I'd love to uh, be able to watch more of your stuff. And Baron's a huge Clyde Barker fan. Um, yep. And I loved learning more about Barker from watching some of his videos. Uh, and, and Barker's daunting because he's so, his, his catalog is enormous. And, yeah. you know, I actually had for a long time had a bit of a bias against Barker. I've oh. never read anything by, by him. I have not read anything, but I know his movies and I know, you know, his, his film adaptations from the eighties and yeah, I, uh, they were of their time. They were not my cup of tea. They're just, they were, they were entertaining in a way, but yeah. nothing really special. Nothing that made me think, man, this is an author I need to read. Uh, Baron changed my view on that. And, and I, I, I want to, I want to correct that. Yeah. Baron, uh, Baron is one of the most concise reviewers. He can get the things mm -hmm. over in like eight to 10 minutes in a one shot. He was always extremely impressive. So Baron, I agree. You should come back and, then we can talk about more Clyde Barker as I, as I finally read uh, some of his books. Um, Andre has a question. Do you have an all time favorite novel? And, and I'm curious about this as well, because like you have, you read everything, you know, from mm -hmm. children's fiction to spy to nonfiction. So do you have just one favorite book? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> As my, I mean, I, I could say if you were to ask me this question maybe 15 or 20 years ago, it would have been a yes. Now, hmm. I don't think I'd give it a yes. Uh, and that's because I don't think about my favorites in the same way that I used to. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've grown to recognize that I enjoy different things in different books. I mean, there yeah. are, there are the, the kinds of enjoyment I derive from books varies from book to book. You know, in some yeah. books, it's a huge adrenaline rush and that's very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. But in other books, it's more of an emotional, uh, cathartic kind of experience. Uh, or maybe I'm, I'm fascinated by really intricate and, and thought provoking world building, or maybe some of the ideas that make me question preconceptions I might have had that I find very enjoyable to be to be challenged like that. Each of those types of enjoyment for me are very different. Yeah. Uh, and it becomes more of an apples and oranges comparison. You know, how do I compare these different types of enjoyment to pick one above all else? Yeah. Because it really depends on what I what kind of enjoyment I'm in the mood for, what kind of enjoyment I need, maybe from a therapeutic standpoint, uh, you know, because mm -hmm. there are comfort reads. And then there are reads that are intentionally challenging, provoking reads, because I want to be challenged. Uh, completely different kinds of enjoyment. So yeah. I, I tend to think in terms of tiers now. So I can't pick a single book, but I could definitely come up with a top tier of, mm -hmm. of books that, all kind of maximize different types of enjoyment. Yeah. And then I have other tiers below that. Uh, and, you know, so if I were to, if you would ask me that question 20 years ago, I think my answer probably would have been Watership Down. Uh, I, I, I absolutely adore Watership Down. I, I mean, it, it's still very much in my top tier, uh, but, you know, I, I can't pick it as the single favorite. I mean, it's also one of the reasons why I, I don't do, you know, top 10, top 20, top 50 videos uh, on my channel. I, I can't make those videos. I, I, I don't know how to rank them. I, I, can't, I can't distinguish in a meaningful way because for me, it's important to have criteria that are, you know, actually distinguishable you know, where I can, I can have gradation to figure out how books compare to one another. And that gets really challenging. And yeah. You know, I think context really matters as well. Um, it's if you're making a top 10 video, but you've only actually read 20 books in total, a top 10 video doesn't really mean anything. 
um, because there are actually thousands of books out there in this broader population of books that you haven't read. Um, and I mean, I'm not saying this as a criticism of channels that do top 10 videos. I'm just kind of looking at it from the perspective of, is it actually meaningful? I mean, what am I, if, if, if I watch a video like that, sometimes, I mean, they can be entertaining, but most of the time, I'm not sure I actually learn anything from the videos. And that's really what I'd like to get from videos is, is have I learned something from it? Um, in part, because a lot of times, you know, the, the top tens or twenties or whatever videos are the, the pool of books that they're drawing from tend to be a lot of the same books um, because people, when they, they start their reading careers, they want to start with books that are already well-known or popular that maybe are already recognized as among the leading titles. And so mm -hmm. people are prioritizing all of the same authors, all of the same titles. I'm generalizing here. Obviously there are exceptions, but yeah, right. But I, I know what um, you're saying, but it becomes an echo chamber where everybody's essentially ranking a very small subset of a broader population of, of, of books. Yeah. And if you're not providing that context in, in the ranking to say, you know, probably the single best way to rank is if you've, if you have a top 10 rank and you've only read 10 books, that is perfect because <laughs> you, your audience knows, okay, this is what you're comparing against. You are comparing book number one to book number 10. You're yeah. not comparing it to book number 20 or book number 500 you know exactly the, the, the context for that ranking. Uh, and so, you know, and then, you know, if you're not clear about what criteria are being used, you know, what does it mean to enjoy a book or what does it mean to be your favorite book? Uh, if, 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 if you're not being very clear about exactly how you're defining it, it was just something I tried to do in my first guy, Gabriel K video where, you know, I made the audacious claim. He's the greatest living, you know, fantasy author. Yeah, it's a debatable claim, absolutely debatable claim. But I tried to, at the outset of the video, say, well, here are my criteria that I'm using. And yeah. you know, some of those criteria absolutely disqualified certain authors who otherwise could make a claim. You know, Michael Moorcock, I had, I had a whole bunch of people comment on, you know, why did you leave Michael Moorcock out? I mean, Moorcock's the greatest. Like, absolutely, an argument can be made for Moorcock being extremely influential in the oh, history yeah, of the okay. fantasy genre and science fiction genres. Um, and he's still alive and still writing. Um, but for me, one of the criteria was consistency and, you know, consistently good. I mean, really good. And for me, Moorcock's too uneven. Some of it is great. Mm. Some of it. Consistency is key. Not so yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to be the greatest author, you have to be able to sustain it you from, to look at from the, the criteria work. that, yeah, that the full body of work and, you know, with very few blemishes on that body of work. Um, and, and, and Moorcock just didn't meet that criteria for me. Yeah. And um, so anyway, I, I do want to flag like, like Michael uh, fit to be read. He's got this massive top 210 <laughs> science fiction books. <laughs> Incredible. Utterly incredible. Uh, and that's a different kind of context. Uh, that, because it is so enormous, it is actually useful. Mm -hmm. Because I know Michael's very widely read um, in the science fiction genre. The only problem I have with his ranking is I have no idea how he was able to get that granularity in his ranking. What is the difference between book number 133 and book number 134? I couldn't do that. I, I don't know how I'd be able to do it. That's why for me, I think in terms of tiers, you know, I could come up with a top 20 and they'd all be in that tier. And then there may be an, a second 30, maybe in the next tier. I mean, just picking numbers out of the hat, but I couldn't really differentiate between them uh, yeah. very easily. So I don't know how Michael did it. Uh, I have great respect for what he did. And I, I, I think that video at three and a half hours long is monumental and incredibly well produced because he got actually many of the authors in that list to contribute little segments and there's music and you know original songs so michael i'm giving you a plug here that is one of the most amazing videos i've ever seen on youtube um but as i said i don't quite understand it because 
I don't know how you did that ranking. I just don't know how. <laughs> Think about that. You know, you said you didn't want to go over an hour with your video. Michael's over yeah. here doing three hour videos. I mean, and that, I watched I, a 10 hour iceberg video on a song of ice and fire the other day. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've watched it twice. Uh, this is my second time watching. Um, I, I agree. I think one, that's, that's a crazy video, but you are right. Uh, the sample size is small for a lot of people, right? And yeah. um, that's why I always love watching Alan's videos at the Library of Alexandria because he reads books no one reads and no one likes. And uh, <laughs> I'm only kidding, Alan. Uh, but seriously, though, K.J. Parker is a guy who's very prolific um, and has a ton of different books. Have you read K.J. Parker? Uh, he is one of my TBRs. Um, You're going to that's love. that. That's the... Uh, how to defend uh, yes. a castle. I don't remember if I'm getting the, the, uh, the, the title it's like right. 16 ways to defend a city. Si or, but city he has writer. other stuff, shorter fiction that yeah. Alan has told me about specifically the deal in economics mm -hmm. with vast details. And I feel oh. like from our conversation that you would be like perfect for that. So, I mean, and Alan can, can say in the chat because he's actually read almost all I think of Parker, but uh, he prefers the short fiction from what I know. And not so much like the mainstay trilogy that a lot of other people read. So yeah. it might be something for you to yeah. to add to that ever growing and forever long TPR of yours. I, I, I mean, I, I just for everybody's you know knowledge, my TBR always runs with about a at least three year, usually maybe four, even five year lag. Um, wow, I read very little current fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and part of this, because of what I said earlier, I, I want to wait until a series is finished before I start it. And so it can take three, four or five years sometimes for these, you know, trilogies or, you know, four book series to actually get finished. Uh, but also I don't want to fall victim to the hype machine that happens when, you know, new releases come out. And of course the publishers and the authors, they want to you know, get a lot of enthusiasm for the books and, you know, people are raving about it and you know, everybody's talking about how much they want to read these books that are coming out. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's this bandwagon effect that I think happens. And yeah, it affects you. And people, people, it, it can affect some of those early reviews because people want to be part of that initial enthusiasm uh, and, and, and momentum behind a book. And what I found is if you wait about three years or four years, when more people end up reading the book and you start looking at the Goodreads reviews and looking at the Amazon reviews, and suddenly there's a lot more diversity of opinion about the mm -hmm. books. And some of the book's flaws start to surface and you start realizing, you know, maybe I don't need to prioritize this. Uh, you know, maybe... You know, given how many other books there are out there that I still want to read, maybe I'll push this one a little farther down the, the yeah. TBR list. And, and so I, I'd like to wait to see which ones are truly going to stand the test of time for those first three or four years before jumping in. Uh, yeah. So I, I, there are many books, you know, I don't talk about them on my channel because, you know, they were published in the last four or five years and I haven't read them. Um, in addition to the fact that many other channels are already talking about them and I don't want to be part of that, you know, sort of echo chamber of all talking about the same books. So I tend to focus on a little bit older books, some much older books, but I, I, I do, uh, want to talk more about on my channel books that were written in the last say 10 years or 15 years. Yeah. Because I have read a lot of those. Um, but there is a lag in my reading. Yeah, I don't think that I think that's a pretty measured approach. I think that that uh, that makes total sense, especially for like your goals and what you want to do. It makes a lot of sense. It is fun to get caught in caught up in the hype for sure. Um, but a lot of times I'm reading stuff that is that is a little bit older, not not maybe quite as old as that. There's still stuff that uh, I read that's finished in the last two or three years. But it's uh, it's nice to see that those uh, extra opinions roll in from from time to time. I'm um, going to probably start wrapping this thing up here, but. Mm -hmm. I did. Uh, we talked a little bit about some editions of books. Did you rem did you happen to pull those off? If you didn't, it's not a big deal. I did, and I I 
I was pressed for time right before we went live. Yeah, you know that I logged in right before we went live and I was trying to gather some stuff up. One of the ones that you wanted to see, I did not grab. I did grab a couple of them though, because they happen to be here in this room rather than a different room. I would love. To I think see you want you wanted to see some Martin stuff, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, <laughs> uh, so I'll I'll, I'll I'll say there are two books that Martin did um, that are in a different part of my house, uh, where mm -hmm. actually most of my fantasy and science fiction stuff is. Um, so Feast for Cro for Crows. Um, I have a first edition of it, which has an absolutely atrocious dust jacket. I hate that red dust so jacket. Bad. <clears throat> I'm so unhappy that they changed the design. Uh, there's a history behind that dust jacket. They actually had a dust jacket commissioned um, from the same artist who did uh, Clash of Kings. And uh, yeah, same, same artist who did Storm of Swords in the same overall design of dust jacket. They had that design, that artist, uh, and they, they produced... That, that dust jacket. And then someone in the editorial chain, publishing chain decided not, nope, not, nope, we need to, we need to change it. We need to standardize the look of the series uh, and not make it look quite so old fashioned. We need to modernize it uh, with just these big symbols that <laughs> don't depict any scene from the book because, you know, uh, depicting yeah. scenes from the book is so 1980s and 90s. Yeah. Uh, These so anyway, terrible. Right. I, I absolutely hate that. Terrible. The so they they actually produced two hundred fifty or thereabouts copies of that or that that earlier design dust jacket with the scene, and I I, I managed to get a copy one of those two hundred fifty dust jackets. So I put it on my first edition of, of Feast of Crows. It's a lovely. Um, lovely dust jacket uh i've actually featured it in a couple of videos so if you if you look at my my fantasy three minute overview one of the very first videos i made on my channel it's not actually on my list of videos anymore but it is in the playlist for fantasy uh it's the first video in the fantasy just a little three minute here's a sample of what's in my fantasy collection i do have it pictured uh briefly in there um and then there's also a, a subterranean press edition called uh, Germ Retrospectives uh, from probably about 20 years ago. It is this massive tome of all of his short fiction. Uh, that he then later republished a few years later as um, um, Dream Songs, you know, the different volumes. Yes. Yep. Uh, so he, 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 but he broke it up into multiple volumes for, you know, general, uh, consumption for mass market consumption, but that, that subterranean press edition, uh, which was very early in sub presses history. Uh, I have a copy of that. Uh, and it's, it's pretty scarce. Uh, I, 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 I love that, uh, edition They're upstairs. I don't have them here. However, I do have, well, let's see. Let me pull a couple of things here. Oh, that did not sound good. <laughs> I dropped a book. Oh, that was not. That was not good. Okay, no damage. No damage. These things are really heavy. They're really, really heavy. Okay. Speaking of sub press, um, I have I have the the sub press germs. I actually have the Misha Merlins, uh, which were the original mm -hmm. uh, specialties. So we have Game of Thrones. Uh, these are Man. The, all the numbered. So I, I, and I, I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm one of the rights holders for the, the numbers. So I, I, I've been fortunate to be able to get them at, um, at That's cost. Yeah. You know, wow. Yeah, that, I mean, they're, they're not cheap and I, I, I don't generally buy a whole lot of these specialty editions because I'm a little skeptical of, Quite frankly, spending that much money on books, I, I, I says a guy with ten thousand books in his library. But you know, I, <laughs> I, I, anyway, you know, I, I, I love these books. Uh, I mean, they're beautiful editions. You know, here's here's the Misha Merlin 
uh, A Clash of Kings. You know, oh, some man. beautiful artwork uh, in it. And I know Sub Press issued their own editions of these two. Those are the ones I have. And I, I don't have those because I refused to buy them because <laughs> yeah. I already had these two. And for me, it just felt like Sub Press was doing a bit of a money grab. Um, and I... Uh, well, so mine have different covers. So did right, they, they're completely different. They did completely different artwork. I mean, for Sub Press, they yeah. hired a completely different artist. Yeah. I mean, they, everything is completely different. Um, yeah. I was just so making these, sure that it wasn't uh, a redo of those, like a reprint of no, those ones. Okay. It's not a re I mean, Misha Merlin has, they, they had their own um, ones, but, they, but, but Misha Merlin basically sold the rights to Sub Press. I think Misha Merlin went out of business or something. So the numbering system is still the same. And then, of course, I think you wanted to see Storm of Swords. Yeah. And they all have different uh, different artists doing them. But this was so big, it had to take two books. Oh, they're, they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, oh, I'm man. Sure order these go in. And I have the other one, but I, I didn't pull it out. Um, and well, I will put that back in the box later because it's a tight fit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a couple of... I know you love The Hobbit. Yes, we both love The Hobbit yeah. more than Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yes, I know. This This is actually a British first edition. Uh, this wow. is the original version of the Riddle game. Uh, it's uh, where it was quite different from the, uh, you know, by, by around the, the fifth printing, I think it was, uh, Tolkien had already gotten into writing Lord of the Rings and realized, ooh, I need to change the whole history of how Bilbo gets the ring and, and really the, the, the history of the ring, uh, because in, in the original version of the Hobbit, you know, this one here, um, the ring is not evil. The ring is just a magic ring. <laughs> Gollum is not some twisted, uh, you know, Monster, unwell yeah. monster who's been, you know, just warped by the influence of the ring. I mean, that's not at all. Gollum is actually an honorable character in the original version of The Hobbit. I didn't uh, know that. You know, he, he makes a deal with Bilbo in the Riddle game, and he fully intends to honor that deal, <laughs> which was, you know, to give him the ring, which, of course, can't happen in the revised version with The Lord of the Rings. Gollum absolutely has to be driven mad by the ring. He has mm -hmm. to completely hold on to that ring. He can't even consider, contemplate the the, the original retcon. <laughs> I mean, complete, well, what's amazing is that uh, Tolkien wrote the retcon into the Lord of the Rings in a yeah. way that it's 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 very clever. Now, if you think about it too much, it doesn't quite add up, but it, it, it's really very clever because when in Fellowship of the Ring, you know, the Fellowship, they arrive for the Council of Elrond and, uh, you know, the, the Elrond or one of the characters, I think it's Elrond, asks Bilbo to step forward and give the Council the story of his finding of the ring. And um, the original, you know, this version is the Red Book of Westmarch in mm. Tolkien's retcon. So Bilbo, you know, Bilbo wrote the Red Book as, I think it's, or maybe I'm getting my, my, my Tolkien lore a little dated, but anyway, bulk, when, when Bilbo wrote, or maybe, no, I, it's been so long since I was, it's I used okay. to be an expert on Tolkien wrote lore. There's I, no I, Tolkien I, uh, scholars in the chat right uh, now. We're good. I, I, well, that's, I, 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 I mean, I was a Tolkien obsessive, 40 years ago. So I, I, once upon a time, I knew, I knew a lot more than I know now. Anyway, the, uh, uh, you know, Bilbo writes his adventures and it's, you know, part of the, the Lord of the Rings, you know, you know, when he, he says, I'm going to go to, yeah, at the beginning of fellowship, you know, I'm, I'm going go to go to, to Rivendell and write my memoir. Well, he, he wrote the Hobbit. That's what Bilbo was writing at, at Rivendell. And in, you know, that version of the Hobbit, is this original first edition, which is not the real story. It's a sanitized version that Bilbo told because he didn't really want to tell the real version. So when El Elrond 
calls on him at the Council of, of Elrond to, to, to tell the real story. Bilbo fesses up and says, you know, you've probably all heard a different tale of my finding of the ring. And I just want to confess that it's not the real tale. Um, I, I faked it. Um, <laughs> and let me, let me tell you the real story. So he basically, Bilbo was confessing, this first edition is a fake. How meta. Very meta. <laughs> very, very, very meta. I love it. Uh, and I, I definitely prefer the the, the rewrite because it, yeah. it adds so much more complexity and, and depth to the story. And, and the riddle game is, it might be my favorite chapter uh, in The Hobbit. It's certainly one of them. Yeah. Uh, and, and the original just doesn't have the same, the same flavor. <clears throat> and, oh, I wanted to show that. And I think I have another short. I have the U.S. U.S. first. Uh, I've never seen The Hobbit. Hobbit. This is well. You can't see it. it. This is a this is a facsimile. It, but this is what the cover looks like. You cannot find copies with the real original cover because the paper that they used at that yeah. time, back in 1938, fell apart. It was so fragile that mm. you know finding a copy with the, with the original dust jack is, I mean, almost impossible. I I had an opportunity to buy one about 15 years ago. And I passed on it because the price was too high. I mean, it was it was going to be the most I'd ever spent on a book by far. And I just couldn't bring myself to buy yeah. it. And in hindsight, I kicked myself because yeah, I, I look at, I, I assumed at the time, well, I'll be able to find another one at a cheaper price than that. No, no. The prices are now for that, that book probably sell for 10 or 20 times at least what I could have bought it for at that point in time. Uh, so, but, but the, the actual book itself inside is in beautiful, pristine condition um, that I have. Uh, I made a short about it uh, about a year ago, if anybody wants to see the actual book. Um, but I, I love that because like you, I prefer The Hobbit over The Lord of the Rings. Uh, Let's go. It is, I mean, and I love The Lord of the Rings, uh, but I'm, I'm more of a Hobbit guy. Uh, and I also love... The second half of the Silmarillion, uh, it's mm -hmm. um, it's so emotionally powerful in, in places, and uh, I um, anyway, I, yeah, I, I I love talking about Tolkien, but it's another one of those authors that I probably won't say a whole lot about on my channel just because it, it yeah it's so widely discussed uh, yes. elsewhere. Uh, but I love the fact that he had a tremendous impact on the genre, and I love. Uh, the fact that he himself was influenced by many other authors yeah. uh, that preceded him uh, because he didn't really invent the wheel at all. He, he refined the design of the wheel, uh, but it's really fun to read things, you know, books, authors from 10, 20, 50, or even a hundred years before Tolkien and, and see very much the influences that he, he lifted directly. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, every thought comes from something before, um, mm -hmm. which R. Scott Baker refers to as the darkness that comes before. Uh, but I, I think that that's true probably for almost every single thing that we love and think as like original, right? Well, I, and I like to put things in context. Uh, you know, context, context is a big thing for me. And I, I, it's why I like talking about the history of genres because you know, these creations that authors make aren't standalones in the sense that they didn't just yeah. instantly come up with these ideas. You know, they've, they're in many cases, they're standing on the shoulders of giants to use right. the, you know, the old saying, uh, you know, they've learned from the authors that came before them, you know, authors who pioneered some of the techniques or who came up with some of the original tropes. You know, we talk about tropes as being, well, they're so tropey. Well, yeah, they're tropey because somebody at some point came up with an original idea that people went, hey, that was a great idea. I want to do something just like that. I'm going to incorporate that into my story. And as more people do that and it gets repeated over and over again, then it becomes a trope. Um, yeah. But I, I love trying to identify where some of these ideas originally came from. Uh, even if the original source material might not be as good as the later stuff. Uh, it's just fun to put it in perspective for me. And, and 
and understanding the, you know, the, how things connect. And, and that's just the way my brain works. I just like to see connections between things and how things are influenced. Um, and I hope I don't bore people when I do that in my videos and talk about a lot of that. I try to keep it to a relative minimum because I could go down rabbit holes that, you know, people <laughs> really just might go, okay, that's too much. And, and that's, that's my, you know, that's my, my debate when I'm, I'm planning videos is, you know, how much is too much, you know, how much detail I'm trying to find that happy medium of, you know, not making it completely surface level, but also not making it too deep of a dive that people get bored or just, you know, like, okay, I, I'm tired of listening to this. I need to, I need to watch a different kind of video. Um, right. Yeah, and click away. And it's a, you know, I don't know if I'm finding the right balance point, but uh, I've been encouraged at least by the, the feedback I've gotten from viewers. So I will continue to try to do that. I mean, I think you, I think you got it down and, and you're going to continue to get better at it. I mean, that's just the nature of doing something more. Yeah. Most likely you, you're going to get better at it. And uh, it, it's crazy uh, how fast your channel's grown and, and the impact you've had. I, I, I think uh, you stand out because you do stuff that is different. And uh, the fact that I get to learn is awesome. I like the lineage of things as well. Like I like seeing, like I, I did this with wrestling, you know, everyone knows the Hulk Hogan's and stuff, but it's like, what well, did you know? Superstar Billy Graham. Did you know Bobby Rogers? Did you know Johnny Saint? Like, you know, you can continuously go back and see where some of these things originated. So uh, I appreciate the videos and uh, I would uh, I would love to have you come back on. Uh, so when you get those ideas, you're like, I'm not sure if I should go down this rabbit hole Just save them and I'll bring you on and we'll do three hours of, of that that rabbit hole, you know. Uh, I, I, I would love to come back. Uh, I, I mean, this has been a lot of fun. I mean, I, I, I had no idea really what to expect. Uh, you know, the audience has been very polite, or maybe you've just been filtering out all of the negative comments so I don't get to see oh, them. They're good. Uh, they're good people. Or that the, uh, the you know, the questions uh, that, that might be questions that I don't really want to answer. You've been keeping them from me. Uh, I, <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and I, I will... You know, continue to try to make my videos in a more timely manner. Um, I'm hoping this summer will be a good opportunity to to chug or churn out a few more than than I have lately. I mean, I've just been very busy the last couple of months. It's it's been a really um, a lot of stuff going on, and I, I hope this summer will be will be you know more opportunities uh, well, to I do mean. that and that I'm not too professorial in my approach. Uh, I yeah you know, I. I, I I'm, I wrestle with that as well. You know, I, I, you know, I want these things to be fun. You know, and I, I got a comment just a couple of days ago, or might have been actually it was yesterday, talking about my Valentine video, saying it's like listening to a college professor give a lecture. And I was thinking, <laughs> I hope that's a good thing. I think he meant it as a good thing because uh, he, he was like, I love listening to these. It's like, okay, great. And I guess I, I try to approach it from the standpoint. I like to learn when I watch videos. So for me, I want to be able to share knowledge, uh, yeah. but I want to share it in a way that's not dull. I want to share it in a way that, you know, engages people that, you know, sparks their interest or, you know, captures their attention. And uh, I, I, it's been a learning experience for me because I've never done anything like this before. Uh, I don't do social media. I'm not on social media at all. Uh, this is my first, you know, toe dipping into social media. I, have never done any kind of video production ever uh, before I started this channel. So I've been self-taught in hmm. everything. You've uh, done a good job, man. Uh, I mean, it, it's been a lot of work <laughs> to try to yeah. figure out it really how, is, though. how mean, to do it. Uh, just a lot of trial and error. Things, you know, it's a lot of time investment. Yeah. I'm, it, it, I, I, I don't think I've, wasted time, although I haven't been as efficient as I really want to be. Um, and, but a part of that is just a learning experience and, you know, figuring out how to do things or figuring out what's the best way to present material. Uh, so, you know, that sort of storytelling aspect of it. I mean, I mean, I'm trying to tell a story. Sometimes it works and sometimes it probably doesn't work as, as well as I'd like it to. Um, and I always appreciate feedback that, you know, is helping me get better at it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I look forward to 
lots of constructive criticism in the future. Um, now that I've I've welcomed it uh, from everybody, uh, and, <laughs> and I am have a whole influx yeah, of <laughs> yeah, I, I I am very sincere. I I I absolutely do welcome uh, constructive criticism. Uh, disagreement is healthy. I, I think we learn from disagreement. If everybody has the same opinion, nobody's learning anything. Um, and I mean, that's, like I said, part of the reason why I started the channel is I wanted to talk about things that nobody else was talking about, or maybe not nobody, but weren't as widely discussed, uh, because it just, you know, helps broaden the discussion. And yeah, yeah, that's my goal. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're well on your way to accomplishing it and have accomplished a, a great deal already. Um, I'd love to have you back on uh, in the future because I have an array of questions I didn't even get to because uh, <laughs> we were just having so much fun. Um, and it also some uh, some people in the chat also had some really great questions, which I've saved. Actually, I went and okay. copied and pasted those. So. I, I did see a few of them and I, I wanted to to jump on them, but I, you know, at the same time, didn't want to completely sidetrack where we already were in the discussion it's hard I mean, there were a lot there were a lot of great comments the ones that i was able to see or questions uh, yeah. so i apologize i didn't cover all of those uh i can't believe we've been going for three hours and 15 minutes uh, this is <laughs> more than i expected uh and i'm still going strong i can't believe this it's all the coffee that i just i say so. you're you're gonna out survive me i think i uh I, I, I should have drank a coffee prior, I guess, but I, I, I've had a, a great time talking with you tonight. Um, and I did save some of those questions and, uh, I just want to appreciate, uh, or give out appreciation to chat. You guys were excellent. You guys were wonderful. You always are. Uh, me and Bridger talked offline before and, you know, he's like wondering what to expect. And I was like, I attract a very healthy, wholesome, encouraging audience. That's also quite funny most of the time. So give yourselves a round of applause for being so supportive. And uh, Bridger, I appreciate, I know this is not everyone comes up to this and does this, you know, this is live. It's in, you know, it's in the moment, which can be very difficult. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for maybe stepping out of your comfort zone a little bit and, you know, giving me your time on a Friday night. I really do appreciate it, man. Well, I've had a lot of fun and I, uh... I, people who know me actually sometimes wish I would not talk so much. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can be a little long-winded at times. I, I fully admit that. And uh, I, I appreciate everyone's patience if I went on a little long in some of my stories this evening, which prevented me from answering questions that you really felt were more pressing. So the fact that you're willing to invite me back on, a, on another show um, makes me feel good that I can, you know, repair any damage that I did this evening. Uh, so, so thank you. <laughs> no damage. Thank at you all. For, you for your patience, everybody. <laughs> it is, uh, it, it was no damage at all. I think it was all good stuff and we'll build upon this now, uh, for next time. And I'm going to ask you a ton of questions about, uh, fantasy that has been forgotten. So, uh, folks, if you're curious about, uh, all of the great knowledge that library ladder has, go check out his channel. I have it linked down below. I also linked the tad video in the description because I honestly think it's maybe the best book video I've ever watched. Uh, it is so good. It's so, so good. And it also mentions me, which is awesome. Uh, you know, that's really it. I do. It's a circular thing. I'm trying to get everyone to come back, you know? Um, but no, sin sincerely, uh, go check out the channel, subscribe. If you have not already, uh, you will have fun. It is engaging and you're going to learn something, which is always good. So, uh, Bridger, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate you. Thank you. It has been a wonderful experience. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it and chat until I see you next time. Be good, be safe. And remember to always, Keep turning the page.